brothers and sisters, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we are Ammon, Topher, and Micah, and together we are the Three, three brothers. brothers! And we are coming at you semi-live for this week's Come Follow Me discussion, where we will give you our three favorite insights, and then we're going to talk about them. Semi-live. Or not live at all, in other words. Not live at all. <laughs> We're doing it semi, not live. As <laughs> always, everything we talk about is free. Free for you, Brothers. free for me. There will be links below the video um, for everything we talk about. We have a weekly readings paper, which is what we use to study to Come Follow Me, which is a nice document that has the Come Follow Me manual, the scriptures for the week, and the church study manuals all combined in order that you just have to read through. Uh, very, very handy, very, very nice. You'll find that link below. And also our insights that we discuss will also be um, linked to the video. You'll find that below. Uh, scriptures are in gold, come follow me is in black and church manuals are in purple and we also record the readings you'll see on our YouTube channel, typically Ashley or Tracy recording that for us and uploading that you'll find that there too and without further ado -do, three brothers are coming at you you <laughs> well ain't that the true true Where that is the true true it is yes. true, true. Okay, let's launch in. Ammon's right. insight number one. And John, John chapter one this week. It says in the student manual, Joseph Smith translation changes. The Joseph Smith translation contains numerous changes to John chapter one. These changes, which can be found in the Bible appendix, provide important clarifications to the scriptural text. I believe that. The very first verse in the book of John was really, I had a bit of a giggle because in the paper that um, has been put together, the, the readings paper that's been put together, it shows both the verse and the changes made from the Joseph Smith translation, which is really handy to read it together, by the way. I encourage everyone to look at it. But I couldn't help but giggle reading the very first verse of John because it has been butchered by the great apostasy. So if you read the very first verse of John, it did say in the King James Version, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, after the Joseph Smith translation, it is almost entirely different. It says in the beginning was the gospel preached through the son and the gospel was the word and the word was with the son and the son was with God. And the son was of God. It's it's so di it's so different. It's so clear. It's so easy to understand. You know, the plain and precious truths had been removed and had been replaced by something else. What had been mm. what what had it been replaced by and why? Preach my gospel has a section in uh, uh, and the section is titled the Great Apostasy, and it says even before the death of the apostles. Many conflicts concerning doctrine arose. The Roman Empire, which at first had persecuted the Christians, later adopted Christianity. Important religious questions were settled by councils. The simple doctrine and ordinances taught by the Savior were debated and changed to conform to worldly philosophies. They physically changed the scriptures, removing plain and precious doctrine from them. They created creeds or statements of belief based on false and changed doctrine. Because of pride, some aspired to positions of influence. People accepted these false ideas and gave honor to false teachers who taught pleasing doctrines rather than divine truth. So why would, su why would such extensive changes be made to this verse and, and others? What were those in the council trying to do? They were clearly trying to amend the scriptures and align them with their own ideas on who God is. And what was their idea of who God and Christ were? This is taken from the Nicene Creed, which is one of these creeds that councils got together and produced. It says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, e eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. 
they destroyed the very character of Christ and God the Father to suit their own narratives and therefore needed to make amendments to the scriptures to that effect. Does the char- And so my question is for everyone today, does the character of God matter? Does it matter? Is there a reason why the, the beginning of the restoration after the thousand years plus of apostasy opened with the the correction to the character of who God is. I think there's a lot, there's a lot to that. This is taken from uh, a Joseph Smith um, sermon. He says, I want to ask this congregation, every man, woman, and child to answer the question in their own heart. What kind of being God is ask yourselves, turn your thoughts to into your hearts and say, if you, any of you have seen, heard, or commute with him, this is a question that may occupy your attention for a long time. I again repeat the question. Remember, he's asking members of the church this question. He's not asking the Romans that made the Nicene Creed. You know, he's not asking the Church of England. He's not asking the Lutherans. He's not asking anyone but us. I again repeat the question. What kind of being is God? Does any man or woman know? Have any of you seen him, heard him, or commune with him? Here is the question that will, peradventure, from this time henceforth, occupy your attention. The scriptures inform us that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If any man does not know God and inquires what kind of being he is, if he will search diligently his own heart, if the declaration of Jesus and the apostles be true, he will realize that he has not eternal life, for there can be eternal life on no other principle. Close quote. So if we don't know or know God or understand his character, we cannot gain eternal life. Seems pretty important then to understand who God is and what his character is. First Nephi chapter 13. And it came to pass that I beheld the remnant of the seed of my brethren and also the book of the Lamb of God, the Bible, which had proceeded forth from the mouth of the Jew, that it came forth from the Gentiles unto the remnant of the seed of my brethren. And after it had come forth unto them, I beheld other books, which came forth by the power of the Lamb, from the Gentiles unto them, unto the convincing of the Gentiles, and the remnant of the seed of my brethren, and also the Jews who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. And the angel spake unto me, saying, These last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first which are of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, John, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him or they cannot be saved. So the Book of Mormon came to us to clarify the doctrine of the Bible, to wipe away the filth accumulated over the great apostasy and align true believers in Christ back to him. Nice. Yeah, really good, Owen. Um, So just like you, by the way, firstly, well, firstly, I was surprised that this week's Come Follow Me was just one chapter of Scripture, John 1. I was like, that's going to be short, right? (laughs) And boy, was I wrong in thinking that because it was just absolutely jam-packed, filled with amazing things. One of the things that I noticed as well was how much the Joseph Smith translation changed John 1. Um, and your your point here on just the first verse is actually really, really good. And um, I love, I, like you say, I love the clarity because you know what the cool thing is, though, that the original version is true. Like both ways are true. You know what I mean? So the original version is true. It's just not the whole truth. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Yeah. True. But confusing, maybe a little. And also the Joseph Smith translation just clarifies that right up. It's like really, really beautiful what it does. And as I was reading through all the scriptures, I was like, man, like it's unreal how much Joseph Smith clarified and fixed this up like it's it's amazing yeah um i, I did notice uh, sorry to cut in i did notice when yeah, i was yeah. reading the old testament i was reading through the old testament for the first time every time i came through to a scripture that had some kind of relationship between god and jesus 
like of who they are and what they are, every single time I would go, that seems a little bit odd to me. And I would look down and there'd be a Joseph Smith translation. And I'd read yeah. the translation and go, oh, of course. Of co- of, oh, there we go. It makes perfect sense. But they had to conform every one of those scriptures to the creeds and the garbage that they were making up about who God, who the Godhead was. So every time yeah. you come across one of them, they, they didn't take the scriptures and make their creeds after it. They made their creeds mm. and then they went and fixed the scriptures so that it aligned with their um, amended view of who God was. Yeah. So isn't yeah. it funny and interesting how true the Bible is, yet how like how much is missing from it, right? Like it's just it's 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 true, but it's incomplete. Just a little yeah, incomplete, askew slightly, but it can, it's still true. It's a very interesting so I think that's a really good um way of um pointing that out. Um and the interesting I like what you were talking about with uh you know the Nicene Creed and the councils and the way that they, you know, um changed the Bible according to their creeds and these councils, right? It's it's such a funny way of thinking. Like how how well, firstly how prideful and 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 whatever do you have to be to have a council decide the doctrine? Like like do you want a council to decide the doctrine or would you prefer a prophet with keys to to explain and expound the doctrine? Do you know what I mean? Like it's such a weird backwards way of of coming to truth because it's not truth because you've just you've just voted on it basically you just voted on what you think is the best like that's insanity like that's crazy um and as you sort of mentioned it's it's their pride and it's their um it's pleasing right what what's pleasing and if we can make this more to what pleases us you know what i mean like let's all vote on it we're all we're all in in, in uh, unison on this good yep yeah, it's nice and pleasing now um and you know, the Nicene Creed that you read that one section there, and it's, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, right? Now, that's pretty clear up to that point. Then it gets a bit weird. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. And it's like, yes, I mean, we could, we could also say the same thing and, it, and it'd be true, but that is confusing. Like, honestly, that, that is a confusing sentence. And why is it confusing? Because who is the author of confusion? You know what I mean? And you can see you can see and understand how this stuff all came about because who is the author of confusion? And why would he yeah. not be in there with his little councils trying to get guys to vote on it and he would have tried to attack and destroy and harm the Bible as much as possible? And, yeah. um, and, and anyway. re- remember this as well. The most dangerous falsity, the most dangerous error, is one that's 99% true and 1% false. Mm. Mm. Because you get you get people almost a ty- entirely aligned to the truth and you move them 1% off and then they just keep moving that direction. Yeah. And then they're gone into f- forbidden paths. So the greatest the greatest lies, the greatest falsities out there are not entirely crazy. They are almost yeah. the truth. But just a little bit of pepper, a little bit of spice on it. And people go, oh, you know, yeah, that seems okay. That seems kind of right. That's well, it's good enough for me. And then they go down that way, and they're just they're unbalanced, right? What what was that? Um, there was this, there was an object lesson we had reading the Old Testament where if a man leans, he's off balance. And so if he's leaning away from the gospel, if he's leaning away from the truth, he's an unbalanced man in all things, and he's easily able to fall. Mm. It's interesting in this in this um, with in the context of what we're talking about, um, being slightly off, knowing what the character of God is, is actually a huge thing to be off on. Do you know what I mean? Like just being slightly off, like one percent off on all of these important things. Like you can do baptism almost right. You could do, you know, like you can do all these things almost right, but it's not right. You know, like it's like the one percent is actually uh, a insurmountable gap. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, awesome. Yeah, I've said I've said the uh, oh, <laughs> silent for too long. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I I've said that for a long time that uh, I've tried to get people to understand that and try to get people to to see that 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 um, that it, it, I've talked about this before. The, the obedience is like the speed limit, and there's those that that 
just go whatever they want. They go 20 over the speed limit. doesn't matter. Then there's those that are floating, you know, you know, just like five miles over the speed limit. You know, just a little bit breaking. And then there's those that they don't, they obey the, the speed limit. And what you need to understand is that Satan isn't interested in getting the people that are going 120 to go 125. He's not interested. They're already in the red. He's just not interested in that. So, like, he's not going to throw these lies like <clears throat> Ammon was talking about that are just out, outlandish at you. He's not. He, he's not going to take those people out. Who Who is he trying to get? He's trying to get those that are going the speed limit to go five over. That's what he's doing. So he's getting the truth, yeah. and he's just 99%, 95% to get you over, which is why I have constantly said the most dangerous people in the church are those that come across as orthodox, uh, co- you know, conservative um, uh, members of the church. The ones that 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 will give you this appearance like, oh, yeah, I believe in traditional marriage and i believe in preserving the church and and they're, they're like 95 percent so all the orthodox all the 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 old school faith as the brother jared members go hey those are my people and then what do they end up doing well then they go well i'm agnostic towards the new jerusalem well i'm a little bit i'm more open-minded with these things and now all of a sudden you have what you have the orthodox members of the church going Wait, am I bigoted? Am I off? Because this person's supposed this person's like me. Do I need to move slightly away? You know, and that's why those types of people are actually far, far more dangerous than the psycho apostates that are just outright psycho apostates. Why? Because the orthodox the, the, the firm members can obviously and clearly identify them as as crazies. And so they, yeah. they don't heed anything they say. But it's those people that appear like they're on your team and then just slowly move the goalposts and then slowly move the goalposts. And then all of a sudden you go, what just happened? What just happened? I, I just had my spiritual foundation weakened. And now, you know, I'm way over here. It's because you, you, you didn't uh, uh, because you didn't understand that the 95 to 5 percent like Amazon is far, far more dangerous. The um, tr- the transcribing the Bible is fascinating because uh, Ammon just focused on what the the you know the obviously the Catholics did to the Bible and and why they would do it to the Bible. It's it's so fascinating though that the other half of this was the Jews. So it's like you have the Jews, you have the Jews who killed Jesus, and now they're like, well, I want to toss these books out because uh, you know these books are bad because they make it really clear that we just killed Jesus. And then this, the, then the the Catholics are like, "Wow, uh, we better throw out these books." And you know, it's interesting because it's like they were both they were both throwing, trying to throw out different things, but both yeah, for the wrong reason. Who could throw out more of the scriptures? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that's what's going on. It was really interesting because it's like the books that both groups agreed were like really, really bad and needed to go are the ones that are like, I can't wait to get my hand, my, my grubby little hands on. Cause those must've been really good. Like the, the book of Enoch was one of the most quoted in the new Testament, which we're going to get to one of the most quoted and both the Catholics and the Jews said, this book's gotta go. This is, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta get rid of this book. Yeah. We, we can't do enough. Transla- retranslations and chopping and yes. changing to fix this one. It's just out. Get get this out of here. So yeah, I'm really I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to reading that book because I, I it had to be like you know it's absolutely insane reading it. But uh, anyway, <laughs> nice. All right. Now, uh, where am I? Number now, one. one- my first insight, and I talk about my 2 a.m. ramblings or whatever, this, my midnight ramblings, this was the first one I wrote, and so it was not midnight, and this is still probably the craziest uh, <laughs> insight I've ever had, honestly, but um, it was kind of cool too. So it was, it was actually last night when I was reading and studying all this and coming up with Excellent. some um, points and insights, and uh uh, this kind of hit me, and I was like, "Oh, this is really cool, actually." So, anyway, let's 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 do this. But brace yourselves. All right. So, verses eight and nine of John chapter one, 
is speaking about John the Baptist, and it says, He was not that light, but came to bear witness of that light, which was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So the church manual uh, for John 1.9 says, The true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John's writings contain the only New Testament teachings about the light of Christ. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, the light of Christ. The Bible dictionary explains the phrase, the light of Christ, does not appear in the Bible, although the principles that apply to it are frequently mentioned therein. The precise phrase is found in Alma 28.14, Moroni 7.18, and Dr. Collins 88.7. Biblical phrases that are sometimes synonymous to the term light of Christ are spirit of the Lord and light of life, the spirit of the Lord the Spirit of the Lord, however, sometimes is used with reference to the Holy Ghost and so must not be taken in every case as having reference to the light of Christ. The light of Christ is just what the words imply, enlightenment, knowledge, and an uplifting, ennobling, persevering influence that comes upon mankind because of Jesus Christ. For instance, Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The light of Christ fills the immensity of space and is the means by which Christ is able to be in all things and is through all things and is round about all things. It giveth life to all things and is the law by which all things are governed. Now I read that I've highlighted this. I read that and that stood out to me like, like that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wow. Um, It is also the light that quickeneth man's understanding In this manner, the light of Christ is related to man's conscience and tells him right from wrong. The light of Christ should not be confused with the personage of the Holy Ghost, for the light of Christ is not a personage at all. Its influence is preliminary to and preparatory to one's receiving the Holy Ghost. Now, that comes from the Bible dictionary about the light of Christ. So, this is my words now. So, here is the fun thought that I had whilst reading this. It kind of blew my mind, actually. I feel like I've probably... heard this maybe thought of this before but reading this i was like wow so bear with me here when we watch sci-fi movies or talk about intergalactic travel in real life it's always measured in light years right a light year is a measurement of distance that is the distance that light travels in one year it is equivalent to 9.46 trillion kilometers or 5.88 trillion miles the nearest stars are about 4.3 light years away or over 20 trillion miles away. We would need to travel at the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second or just under 300,000 kilometers per second for 4.3 years to reach the nearest star. Not only is the distance insurmountable, we also cannot even travel at the speed of light. It's technically impossible. The faster an object travels, the heavier it becomes. Uh, So traveling at the speed of light is therefore impossible because an object would become infinitely heavy and require an infinite amount of energy to accelerate to that speed. Only massless particles like protons, or what is light itself, the protons, um, can travel at the speed of light because they are massless. They have no mass. So why am I giving us this science lesson, right? What am I talking about here? Firstly, we're not going anywhere, right? Not not with not with uh, you know interplanetary travel at the speed of light. It's not going to happen. Um, but wait, how does Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and the angels move uh, across infinite space, infinite distance, instantaneously? The answer is the light of Christ, as well. The light of Christ is back on the the the, the student manual. The light of Christ fills the immensity of space and is the means by which Christ is able to be in all things and is through all things and is round about all things. It giveth life to all things and is the law by which all things are governed. My words again. So the light of Christ is not protons. It is the governing power of Christ, and it is in and through all things. God and his angels do not need to travel vast distances because the light of Christ is already there. It doesn't need to travel any distance. It's there already. It's in and through all things. And I was like last night trying to type this out. Like this is in my head. I've just had this cool like understanding of how this actually works. And I'm like, how do I explain this? So hopefully this makes sense. But it's already touching everything, right? So imagine if you could somehow be touching all things at once. 
if you need to travel somewhere, no matter how far, you're already touching it. You don't need to travel to it, right? You're already there, essentially. Done, instant, instantaneously. Um, and so this makes sense in my head. I hope it makes sense as I'm, as I'm explaining it. Um, and this isn't the only cool thing about the light of Christ. As the student manual says there, it is also the light that quickeneth man's understanding. In this manner, the light of Christ is related to man's conscience and tells him right from wrong. My words again. So therefore... The Lord is not only aware of and touching all things, but he is also aware of and touching us at all times. The manual says, Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And my words say again, he is with us always, enlightening, uplifting, ennobling, and inspiring us. He is literally the light of life, and all good comes through him. And to me, there is something that's really comforting about knowing that his light is on me always, you know, and on all of us always, around us, through us, helping us always. That, and this isn't even taking into account the Holy Ghost, right, or other spiritual gifts and things like this, just the light of Christ in general. There's something really comforting about having that understanding and that knowledge. So that's it. That And that hit me last night when I was reading it, that how important and amazing the light of Christ is and how it's actually the key to pretty much how everything works. It's the governing power of Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if anyone hears that and goes, ah, oh, that's crazy. Don't forget all the scriptures where, you know, the people are teach prophets are teaching us that if you have just the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you can literally move a mountain. And we all know you can't physically just move a mountain as a human, but through the power of faith, you can do all things. So there, there's obviously a lot more going on behind the scenes that we don't technically understand the science behind, but we do understand the spiritual principle behind. And so it's anyway, a really interesting point where you've taken the spiritual principle and then you've tried to tie it back to things that you understand on, you know, from, from our current scientific position. And what I really enjoyed about that is it makes you think of the immensity of space, the immensity of the creations that, the Lord has created in our seemingly infinite universe, how vast it is, how distant they are. And yet through the, through his light, through his power, he's able to touch and be involved with all of those things at any moment in any one period of time. And if he couldn't do those things, um, that's another thing that tripped up all the churches around the Nicene Creed era they couldn't decide whether or not God was omnipresent or whether he was present in a single state because they knew that he had the ability to touch all things at all times. And so they started to think that maybe he was omnipresent, which means he is, he is everything everywhere rather than an individual with a body. So that was something that tripped, tripped people up. They were trying to put together the science with what they understood and they got it wrong. Um, but here we're looking at the doctrine and going, how does that relate to our natural world? Well, if he's light and, you know, <laughs> massless light and touches all things at all times, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I don't know how it all works, but I'll tell you what it did do. It made me really think about the vastness of creation, um, the power of God, and the fact that at some point all of this is going to become so obvious to us when it's all revealed to us we're going to be like oh of course like that makes perfect sense but i really enjoyed that and i think light is absolutely the key yeah i so here's the cool thing is science can't explain it we can't understand it like there's no way we can understand or explain that and we know um, it yeah then we know it and it is true it has to be and it is um but here's the thing right so growing up i don't know if you'll be that you guys are the same as me but, um, you know, when they say um, when you're in the celestial kingdom or in the millennium, when you're translate, trans, transfigured or translated or you're resurrected, you can, tra- you know, travel at the speed of a thought. Right. And I, I had heard people tell me that that's, it was the speed of light. You could travel at the speed of light, but it's not. It's not the speed of light even because light still is too slow. <laughs> <laughs> light light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second and it could still not get from where heavenly father is to here in it would take forever you know so if let's say god and and, and the savior need to come from kolob to here at the speed of light it ain't happening man so it's not even it's not even light it's 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 
it's the light of Christ. It's not light. It's the light of Christ. It's his governing power that allows that travel. So, um, and it's, again, science ain't going to understand it and compete with it. But they, they can go, boom, down instantly from wherever they are, which could be forever away. It's just, I don't know, it's really cool. It's like mind-blowing, eh? It's really cool. It is. In the twinkling of an eye, you know, it's a... Uh... It, that's uh, if you could hide a Kolob, it's really interesting because uh, it, um, interesting how different generations in the church have been drawn to different songs. And, and um, the millennial generation, actually, one of their favorite songs, which has been weird, people have noted that it's weird, is actually if you could hide a Kolob. It actually wasn't a, a song that has been really popular in the church, but for some reason, and maybe it is just because of the, the exactly that, just the. Uh, um, the wondrous space of awe, like the wondrous awe that we're in uh, of space, which we really didn't, we really didn't have maybe as much of a grasp of uh, in in previous generations. You know, like people have uh, uh, pictures of space that mm. are pretty cool now that maybe you know make us think a little bit more about this. But like, uh, yeah, it's a, the the twinkling of an eye, the instantaneous nature of it, and it's interesting because. Um, uh, it, it's one of those things that, in in my opinion, uh, gives a lot of of um, humanistic qualities to Joseph Smith's testimonies because he goes out of his way to to try to describe what he's looking at so so much that that and, and he he can't quite find the words for it like yeah. a conduit opened up or there is a this portal or they, like and then gone. And uh, so I think it's it's interesting because it's like somebody who's made up a lie will stick to that. But somebody who's like, you know, you know what it was like? It was like this. And then like the next day it was like, oh, you know what it was like? Because uh, yeah. you're trying to explain it to that yeah. person, right? So it's yeah. like, I know what Topher's gone through, right? And so it's like, oh, Topher, you know what it was like? You know that uh, thing that you saw and when you we were 12? And Yeah, it was like that. And then you talk to this person over here. It was like, oh, you know john like john you know what it was like it was like five years ago when like that's how we describe stuff and uh so when people get upset that joseph smith um uh changed how he was just trying to describe stuff to people to me i i think that's completely counterintuitive because the way i would try to the way i would try to explain something to topher is not how i would explain it to ashley is because I, I i'm i'm a, i'm on totally different depths of knowledge that i'm working on here with ashley that i yeah. that i am with you know somebody else so i i think it's it, it's it's one of those cool subjects that i think uh also makes me i, I love anything that innate that um showcases just how human people can people are and uh, that was one of those things and, and joseph really thought this stuff was cool too i love the the, the the topic of the light of christ as well because this is one of those ones where it's like I mean, I, well, it's in the school of Joseph's boys, but it's like, it's one of those ones that's like, if we actually had a grasp of the light of Christ, and how awesome it was, and, and the difference between the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost, it, it's one of those, those key components that, that, that people just wouldn't go apostate on. And uh, it's one of those ones that people continue to go apostate on because they, they just don't know the difference. They just, I don't know the difference. And, uh, and it was one of those moments where, I've said, man, it brought it brought it got me a little teary when um, somebody uh, in Discord posted um, that that you know this this lady you know that was a friend of mine, or, you know we're all because we're all experiencing this, you know it's our ex state state presidents, it's our best friends, you know she's just decided to be Mormon no more, and her big uh, her big proof of that was that people. People are having profound spiritual experiences out of the church, and people are having profound spiritual experiences in the church. Ergo, there's nothing special about the church because you can have spiritual experiences outside the church, and that proves that the church doesn't have a monopoly on that. And I, and I read that comment, and I said, that person doesn't understand the difference between the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost. Obviously, people in the world have 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 the right to profound spiritual experiences through the light of Christ. And all of a sudden, Joseph's boy after Joseph's boy just started popping up and going, well, I think what I would do is teach the difference between the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost. And, 
because that's clear. And it was just like one after the other, after the other. And it was just like, this is the purpose of the school of Joseph's boys. This is it. It, it, because now that they have these tools in their arsenal, when they see a problem, they 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 they, inst- they, are, they know the answer. I know the answer to this. It's because I know know, know the difference between these two things. And uh, the light of Christ is a, is just an an amazing thing. And it, once you start to understand the light of Christ, by the time you start to understand how awesome it is, you then have the gift of the Holy Ghost, and you find out that that's the greatest gift God can give you in this life. And you go, wow. So if the light of Christ was as amazing as this, the Holy Ghost and, and his capacity and what he's able to do is just it just it just it adds layers and adds layers and adds layers. So anyway. Love yeah. love nice. love the topic. Love the topic. Yeah. I think that's what got me is I didn't I, I did know, but like it just really hit me how important it is. It's the gov- it's governing everything. You know what I mean? It's 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 the governing it's power of Christ. It's just it's so important. Yeah, and so that's why it hit me. Yeah, it's cool. Anywho, yeah, your turn, it, Micah. All right. Did it hit you at five point eight eight trillion miles per hour? Though, is the slightly real, less real question? But close. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're, we're too heavy. We're too we're heavy. Too heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, it's true. It's true. All right. All right. Number one for Micah. Okay. So the Come Follow Me student manual under We Have Found the Messiah. We read, as you read and ponder John chapter one, record the impressions you receive. We've talked a lot about recording in Come Follow Me. What message is do you find that will be of the most value to you and your family? And then this is the big one that I want to draw attention to. What could you share in your church classes? It asks. In the student manual for uh, John 141, disciples of Jesus Christ share their witnesses or witness with others. Elder David B. Haight of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles recounted the time when the Savior met John and Andrew. The two men followed Jesus to where he was dwelling and stayed with him for some time. Then Elder Haight explained how this spiritual... A scriptural account can inspire us to share our testimonies of the truth. John and Andrew were with the Savior for several hours. Just imagine being in his presence or being able to sit and look into his eyes or to hear him explain who he was and why he had come to earth and to hear the to hear that inflection in his voice in describing what he would have told those young men. They would have shaken his hand. They would have felt of that precious, wonderful personality as they listened to him. And following that encounter, the account says that Andrew went to find his brother Simon because he had to share it with someone. When Andrew found his brother Simon, he he said to him, we have found the Messiah. He probably said, we've been in his presence. We felt of his personality. We know that what he is telling us is true. Yes, Andrew had to share it with someone. That is what we do in sharing what we know and what we understand. President Dallin H. Oaks, the first president, he spoke of why those with testimonies of divine truths should share their testimonies with others. Those who have a testimony of the restored gospel also have a duty to share it. The Book of Mormon teaches that we should stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that we may be in. One of the most impressive teachings on the relationship between the gift of the of a testimony and the duty to bear it is in the 46th section of the Doctrine and Covenants in, in describing different kinds of spiritual gifts. This Revelation states, to some it is given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. To others it is given to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. Those who have the gift to know have an obvious duty to bear their witness so that those who have the gift to believe on their words might also have eternal life. There has never been a greater need for us to profess our faith privately and publicly. Though some profess atheism, there are many who are open to additional truths about God. To these sincere seekers, we need to affirm the existence of God, the eternal Father, the divine mission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the reality of the restoration. We must be valiant in our testimony of Jesus, end quote. And valiant uh, in our testimony of Jesus is one of those ones that 
d- distinguishes members of the church from the terrestrial to the celestial. So that choice of words was intentional. And here are my words. President Nelson committed the saints to do everything they could to strengthen their testimony of the Savior by deepening their understanding of the doctrine taught in the Lord's true church. President Nelson later expanded that commitment, including three points. One, relentlessly seek truth. Two, make and keep covenants or pledges to God and each other, I would add. Three, help gather Israel. If these three things were not important, our prophet, President Nelson, would not be stressing them so often and for so long. If these things could all be obtained by simply going to church or simply going to the temple, etc., the prophet would have simply have said that. One, go to church. Two, go to the temple. He didn't. The school of Joseph's boys was made and runs with these three things literally in mind. One, relentlessly seek truth and share it freely with each other. Knowledge that is literally required to know and be obedient to in order to obtain exaltation. To learn to make and keep pledges to God and each other. To be a covenant making and keeping people in all things. Three, help gather Israel by gathering the gatherers. You are them, brothers and sisters. You are among those who the Lord knew would be his most valiant sons and daughters who would stand on principle and stand alone if need be. You are the gatherers of Israel, and we must gather on both sides of the veil in order to obtain exaltation, period. These classes were inspired by God and have blessed the lives of everyone who have taken part in them, and I bear my testimony of that. They have helped specifically and directly fulfill what the prophet of the Lord has pleaded with us to do a prophet who even more recently committed the saints to become the righteous people who have sanctified themselves by making and keeping covenants with God, a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. There is is not only nothing wrong with deepening our understanding of the doctrine taught in the Lord's church and then sharing what we have learned with others. It is a commandment from our Lord and Savior to do so. I hope to see more and more seize those blessings and less people trying to tear down the obedient. Amen. Amen. So the missionaries came over my house, I think it was last night, um, just to drop in and say hi. And we got to talking as we do. And I started to share some, uh, they, asked me, they asked me to share my favorite scripture and I shared something. And then I said, I just want to share one more thing with you. And I went into third Nephi chapter 21 and I started talking about the redemption of Zion, the return of the, the, the latter day servant who is going to work in the hands of the Lord in preparation of doing those things. And that it's Joseph Smith. And anyway, their minds began to expand as you do those sort of things. And at the end of the night, as they were leaving, they said, Brother Wilkes, what are your study habits? How do you how do you take this and understand that and pull out scriptures without having them marked? And you can just pull open quotes and do this and do that. And I said, it's actually that's a great question. And the answer is that we have a group of people in these classes. We call it the School of Joseph's Boys because Joseph called his his friends, his mates, they called him his boys. He loved them and he wanted them to uh, to come up with him and learn and become like him and gain knowledge like him, become like the Savior. And we get together and when we're all gathered together, sharing our insights on one topic and we're all willing, trying to unify ourselves behind the one true doctrine on that topic, all of a sudden the spirit is edifying and uplifting and you're learning from all these different perspectives and, and getting all these different scriptures, all these different quotes. It is turbocharging my learning experience. And it's because of those moments, learning together in this group, in the School of Joseph's Boys and in our Zion Bus group, my learning has done a hundredfold more than I could ever possibly do by myself. And for that, I am eternally grateful. The principle here is this as we gather together and unify behind the doctrine and teach each other the doctrine, members and non-members alike, our own 
understanding deepens, our own conversion to the doctrine deepens. And then we have this amazing, we have these amazing spiritual experiences. So I can testify boldly behind Micah that these classes have been life-changing for me and this group gathering together and sharing your spiritual insight, sharing your testimonies has been life-changing and spiritually found spiritual foundation building for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I would add my testimony to that fact that these these classes that we talk about now, there, there might be people who watch this who don't know what we're talking about. We we have mentioned it a few times, but we do have these classes called, we call it the School of Joseph Boys. And uh, we have, what is it, eight topics? A class, like a, is Nine. Nine. Nine, and uh, we we break down, and they're just they're just like basic truths of the gospel, but we 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 get everyone to study them, and then we expound on them together. And honestly, it is so awesome, it is so beautiful to have the perspective, the understanding of all these different people on the same truth, um, to uplift each other on it. Every single time I've done the class, it's been awesome. Every single time to get, oh, it's just really really good, and the spirit really does some good work in there, <laughs> honestly. Um, and uh, so I, I, te- I also agree and testify that, that the, these classes are amazing. And um, anyone who has anything negative to say about them, you haven't done the classes, definitely. Yep. So um, I would I would recommend that, you know, if, if you're interested to, to jump on our Discord server and, and, and sign on up because it's honestly fantastic. Um, I like what you were talking about, Micah, with um, what President Nelson said, one, two, and three. And number one was relentlessly seek truth. I love that word relentless, like it's nonstop, it's never ending. And it's about finding truth, right? Because that 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 matters. And again, it's not it's not truth decided on by a council of people. We know where we can find truth. And it's um, and this is the good thing about the, the School of Justice Boys is that we've got the truth and we're relentlessly seeking to study and understand it. And we do that and help each other to do that. The relentlessness of it is awesome. Um, and then the making and keeping the covenants um, is awesome too. And what's cool about that yeah, and, and, and doing this together is that we, we kind of keep ourselves, each other accountable as well. Um, and that's what Zion is too. Like we're keeping each other accountable and, and becoming a, you know, of one heart and one mind, like unified as a Zion-like people accountable to each other because that's what really like Zion would need. You need to be accountable to each other and accountable to God. Um, you know, this honesty and understanding and trust and, and you know, like that. I love that. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say? Um, anyway, I can't, I can't remember what else I was going to say, but yes, I agree. It's awesome. Um, and it's funny because this whole thing that you read is my third insight. So I probably won't need to read most of that. <laughs> again. Oh, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, look, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, relentlessly seek truth make covenants, be accountable. And I think my my um, insight, I think, is about the point number three, helping gather Israel, which is obviously important. And uh, just on that, I think I've probably said it before, but what one of the big differences I noticed about myself, I mean, from being young in the church um, and to, to now having served a mission, and um, when you know and understand truth and truly believe it, you, I think you can't help but want others to have it. Like um, the scripture that you talked um, about, I think David B. Hay, he mentions how Andrew was with the Savior and immediately had to go find his brother, right? Or his was his brother or his cousin, um, Simon Peter. So his brother. So, you know, he, you know I, I can imagine being in that, that, that exact position, being in the Savior's presence, right? Unbeatable. Un, like how, do you, how could you beat that experience? And the first thing you'd want to do is go, holy moly, who can I get to come and experience this? You know? Yes. And in, in in our lives right now, I think the first thing you would do is, how do I get my family? You know, I need my family in in on this, you know, this That's amazing true. thing. And then after that, I need my friends. And then after that, hey, everyone, I want anyone. So now, you know what? I honestly, and, and it's a shame. The opportunity doesn't come up as much as I'd like, but I would love and cherish every opportunity and do to ever talk about the gospel to anybody, you know, like it's like, I, I, I kind of wish the opportunity to come up more, 
but that's the monotony of daily life, going to work, coming home, and uh, <laughs> going to bed <laughs> over and over again until I die. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, the, the importance of sharing it and the, you know, um, I love what you said. Um, the difference between a celestial and terrestrial person is um, uh, what's the what's the phrasing? Um, valiant in your testimony. Yeah, I love that. And then I'm like, oh, geez, am I valiant in my testimony? You know, what I mean? like I literally go, geez, am I? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, well, I hope I am. <laughs> I am valiant in it. I want to share it with others. But anyway, I love it. I love, I love, I love the, uh, I love the insight. Awesome. Two, two things before we move on. First thing is, is that uh, I, I, we say this all the time, all the time, but apparently people still don't know this. Like all these things are free. Okay. So when Topher says show up on discord and sign up for something, it, it just means, Hey, I'm here. Can I join? That's literally what it means. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean sign up for some newsletter or like give us nine ninety nine a month. It's it, we oh, all, God. Vol- yeah, yeah correct, correct. we just, we volunteer for these things. <laughs> This is all volunteer, yeah. and and this is not something run by me. This is something run by a group of people. So you might not even see me, right? So you might not even see Ammon or Topher, right? So this isn't something run by us. This is stuff run by, you know, a hundred plus probably now Joseph's boys that'll volunteer their time to to do this, and they'll meet together and do that. The second thing that I, I just wanted to say here is that uh, Joseph Smith taught us, and this is something that just comes up time and time again, but people, there's another one that people just don't get. They say, oh, well, uh, it's all about my personal relationship with Jesus. It's all about my personal relationship with Jesus. Joseph Smith taught over and over. He spent his life bleeding out for Zion, and he taught so clearly that the greatest blessings and manifestations never are on individual enterprise. Never. Not like, oh, sometimes they are. Never. They are never. It is always a collective. It is always a collective. So when we get together and, and so, so, you know, the, the you know, uh, one of the topics is light of Christ versus Holy Ghost, right? Versus second comfort. Like, what's the difference? And when I study those topics and, and Topher studies those topics and Ammon studies those topics and we get together and we share quotes from the scriptures and it will never, that experience of saying a prayer, coming together and talking about, will never come close to Micah studying on his own. It will never come close. So anything that we can do with a collective will always trump it. But we, we, we just want to be so independent, these million different strings attached to Jesus that we just cut each other off from each other. And it's like, well, there you go. There's Zion. It's gone. You just cut the lifeblood of Zion out before it even had a chance to start. We we have to have each other. It's not, ju- it's not just good enough if Micah makes it and his family makes it. I need Topher and I need Topher's family. And I need Ammon and I need his family. It's not, it, we need to get past this selfish mentality that we have. We need each other. Hey man, well said. Now, I mean, what is Zion if what what is Zion if 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 the people you love and all your friends and family and everyone aren't there? You know what I mean? Like, what is it? Hey Amen. A bunch of strangers, and a bunch of strangers standing how, around. How do you ever expect to have Zion if you're not going to be Zion right now? Yeah, yeah, of course, right now. Like, if you're not going to yeah. start, you don't start doing those when things, it, yeah, you don't start when it exists. You don't yeah. start loving other people when the Lord tells you to. You, yeah. yeah, and and you can only you can't say that you love people and then not treat them the way that you would want to be treated, right? It's again, there's hypocrisy there. I love the Lord. Okay, well, why haven't you kept my commandments? Um, you know, that's that a big, a big part of John actually is about that. You can't yes. say that you know God, you can't say that you understand the character of God, yeah. Jesus Christ, unless you do the things. You know, eternal life is to know the only yeah. true and living God, and we know that we know him because we keep his commandments. And those that don't keep his commandments to say they know God, the truth is not in them. I think that's first John something something. So the the point being, <laughs> if we're not gonna Yeah, it's first John chapter first and something. Something, something. Uh, yeah. something, something. You guys will you guys will find it. I'm not I'm not one for the scriptures, I'm one at uh, picking up three or four words from scriptures. Um <laughs> we don't if we don't try to become Zion now, 
it doesn't just magically fall out of heaven. Mm, That's yeah. why it's been 100 years without Zion so far. We all yep. sit around saying, shouldn't the money be better spent? Shouldn't our time be better spent just sitting around waiting? Shouldn't our time be better spent just um, on me? It, on exactly. me and my family. No one else. Just take, taking care of us. And if it happens, it happens. If it happens in my lifetime, cool. If not, at least I got a fat retirement fund and an $8,000 bookshelf behind me. So it, at the end of the day, if we're not going to start trying to become Zion, like, like without just using our mouths, but actually doing it, it doesn't happen. Right. And so for those people out there that are only worried about number one all day, every day, and they're not opening their mouths and they're not trying to share and they're not trying to be zealous in l- gaining knowledge and then instantly like these examples running to people and trying to share the things that they've learned, why why would they even want Zion? It's yeah. just more of that. Exactly. Number one, they're never going to build it. They'll never be a part of it. But even no. if Zion fell out of the sky and somebody and knocked them on the head and someone said, hey, why didn't you come in? What makes you think that you're going to want to be in there if you're not going to do it already? Yeah. Ask yeah. Go, these are questions we should all be asking ourselves, I think. Yes. And if you need help, and if you need, if you're inside a bus and you need help with anything, ask. You know, try us. I, 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 I can promise you, you won't, you won't find another group of saints that that care as much and that'll take time out of their day to talk to you and 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 be a friend. So, sometimes we're busy, but but ask us if if something's going wrong and, and you're suffering from something, please reach out. Reach out to us. Lock arms with us. You will you will not find a a a more uh, a, a better group of saints i'm just i'm, I'm really convinced of that they're just the, the, the salt of the earth yep mm-hmm. yep good stuff great awesome. stuff all right let's do this do it do it Simmons inside number two brothers two of the three brothers and uh coming up to the third brother all right so at verse 12 and verse 13 but as many as received him to get to them gave he power to become the sons of god only to them who believe on his name sort of the point we just sort of finished up on he was not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god in the come follow me come follow me manual it says jesus christ gives us power to become the sons and daughters of god Although we are all spirit daughters and sons of God the Father, when we sin, we become estranged or separated from him. Jesus Christ offers us a way back through his atoning sacrifice. Ponder what John teaches about becoming daughters and sons of God and consider also what these scriptures teach about how we receive this gift. And it gives a few more options. What does it mean to you to have power to become a son of God? In the student manual, it says we will... When we accept Christ and join the church, we have power given us to become the sons of God. We are not his sons and daughters by church membership alone. So just having the the baptism, the ticket in the door, doesn't guarantee you that you're going to become a, a son of God. But we have the ability and the capacity and the power to attain unto that status after we accept the Lord with all our hearts. And again, accepting the Lord with all our hearts is not mouth treatment, like we just explained. It's to actually do and become. Okay. My words, becoming a son of God is to prepare ourselves to be like him, becoming spiritual sons of Jesus Christ. He commands us to be perfect, even as he is perfect. We must first understand our relationship with God, which I mentioned in my first point. And we are then to seek after Christ-like attributes such as charity and faith and hope and love in order to do so. In Mosiah 5.13, it says, For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served and who is a stranger unto him and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart and that we need and that we do not obey him? My words, he commands us to do the things which he has seen him do because Jesus Christ did all and only that which he saw the Father do. It explains why he can sit on the right hand of the Father in exaltation, because he followed the same example, because he did the, he's doing, he walked the walk. 
And now he's saying to us, I showed you the, the path. Now you need to walk that path. And Joseph Smith said, what did Jesus do? Why? I do the things I saw my father do when the worlds came rolling into existence. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same. And when I get my kingdom, I shall present it to my father so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom, and it will exalt him in glory. He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and thereby become exalted myself, so that Jesus treads in the tracks of his father and inherits what God did before. And God is thus glorified and exalted in the salvation and exaltation of his children. Close quote. So God's sons should grow to be like him and do all that he does. We have got to learn how to be God's ourselves right now. So like the conversation about Zion, if we want to become a Zion people for a Zion place, we actually have to become the Zion people. We can't just, again, wait for it to fall out of the sky and then hope that we can enter. If we want, if we're expecting exaltation, if we're expecting to become like gods, then we, we have to be gods in training right now. Joseph Smith again, he said, here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God. And you have got to learn to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings. Light and to sit in glory, as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. Close quote. So if we don't learn the true character of God and understand his ways, we will never be able to emulate it, gain those characteristics, and become the God we were destined to be. Christ was the perfect example, and the prophets guide us to follow that example. You want to know how to follow Jesus Christ? Follow the prophets that lead to him. It should be hard. It is conditional. It shouldn't be the way of the world. It should be painful. Just as sanctification of gold through intense fire melts away the dross, so too will the Holy Ghost sanctify the righteous in their repentant struggle to be refined like under Christ. Goes perfectly with what we were just talking about. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Um, like we, like we, we should be trying to emulate the Savior. Like the Savior was emulating the Father, right? And we should be emulating the Savior because we want to become like Him, so that we can become like the Father. Because what is it? As as man now is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Right? Um, yeah. yeah. And I wish I had studied this recently because I. Like the like like I said, there's a Joseph Boys class based on becoming the sons of God, right? Um, and uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff about that. And um, I've just lost my place. Um, and but what it's about is we need to become like him, so that when he appears, we we are like him, right? And we will recognize him because we'll be like him, and. Uh, you know, and obviously we're going to be, there's still a, an enormous gap. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But he'll make up the difference. That's the cool thing is he makes the difference up himself. As long as we're doing everything we can to become like him, uh, he will make up that gap so that we can become the sons of God um, and, and be on that track to gain that eternal life, to become like the father. Um, that's a, this, this one's a deep, a deep subject, man. A, a deep and long and awesome uh, subject to study, by the way. Yeah. The, the thing that got the, the crux of it for me, I think, is this. God actually expects us to become like him now. And we can only do that to the extent that we give our absolute best effort. Like, I understand that. We can't be perfect in this life. But that doesn't take away the requirement to become perfect. And he's expecting us to do as much of that as we possibly can right now. We're supposed to be gods in training in order to become like him. It's not like you, you, you can be an absolute unrepentant person in this life and then expect that God is going to level you up into his ranks in the next life. Like it's just, you know, okay, 
because you made it to the end, boom, here you go. You're supposed to be moving from line upon line, precept upon precept, a little light to a greater light, a smaller understanding to a greater understanding. That's the way it's, it, it actually works with light and understanding. It happens from small to large. It's not like you have this much light, but when you die and you're resurrected, all of a sudden you get all the light. You're supposed to gain it over a period of time and you struggle for it. That's why when President Nelson says, I want you to be relentlessly seeking truth, it's it's not because we're all really we're all dumb and we don't we don't understand some truth. It's that we are constantly supposed to become more like God. And the only way we can do that, a being who is all truth and all knowledge, is to be gaining more of it to become like him. So um and, and so it, ki- it kills narratives of things like, I've got mel- well-meaning friends. <laughs> I was going to say mel-weaning. Uh, that's interesting. They're, they're weaned from being mel. Um, I've got well-meaning friends who say they things like... They want the like, milk. Exactly. They, want the, they, want, they don't want to be weaned from the mel wilk. There you the go. Milk. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to be weaned from the milk. And they say things like, I just don't get into the deep. I don't get into the deep stuff. I just, you know, faith, hope, love, and I'm just going to go to church and I'm just going to faith, faith, hope, and love my way through. And, you know, God doesn't want me to do any more than that. That's what God wants me to do. Well, it's actually literally the opposite of that. And, <laughs> and, that's, and that's not a slight. It's because the world is telling them that they don't need to do anything. Yep. And unfortunately, the teachings of the world have infiltrated the church and so our members of our church are starting to parrot the ideas of the world, which is you are enough and you don't need to be any more than you currently are. And literally the opposite is what our father wants from us. He wants us to become like him and you cannot become like him as you are. Okay. He accepts you at for who you are, but he doesn't want you to remain as you are. And there's a great, I think there's a great quote from elder, um, Holland, Holland on that. Yeah. Mm. He, he takes you as you are, but he does not want you to remain as you are. So anyone that's parroting this idea that you just stay the way you are, you're perfect as you are, love, 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 everyone's perfect. Everyone is the way they, they are. No one, no one can be perfect technically, so we don't even try. All of that is rubbish. Uh, Joseph Smith blew that out of the ballpark right here. The student manuals are killing it. John today is not an outdated doctrine. If you want to become like the Lord, you have to keep his commandments and you have to strive and constantly work until you're becoming actually like him. Yeah. That's such a good point. I like the, the world, the world is saying to everyone, you can be exactly what you are. Don't change. And everyone should accept you no matter what you say you are basically. And whereas the savior is like, well, I love you, but he's always trying to stretch us and to improve us to help us to improve and grow and to become like him. If we're not on the track to becoming more like him to be perfected, you may as well be going backwards. Like what, you know, like what, what, nothing else matters. That's, that's a sad thing is that people don't understand that. Um, And, you know, babies, babies drink milk because that's all they're ready for, you know, but when they grow up, and they can handle meat, they get meat. Do you know what I mean? We feed them meat. And you know what? We should all be meat eaters. And I'm not talking, you know, be a vegan if you want, but in terms of, you know, spiritual things, if you're stuck drinking milk, you're, you're really missing out on, on the, the meat of the gospel. It shouldn't be, um, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the milk for my whole life. That's not what the Lord expects. You know, he, he, you know if you, your capacity is to, to eat, take meat. He expects you to, to take that meat, to study the meatiness of the gospel. Yeah. You know, Ammon's first point, I, Ammon's first point, I, I was thinking when, when he gave the point, and I actually mentioned this, but how honesty is just coming up time and time again. It was starting to be this way with the Old Testament as well. Can, can you tell the truth and can you think of somebody other than yourself? And, and Ammon's first point was just talking about, once again, dishonesty. People just being dishonest. They're taking stuff out of the scriptures dishonestly. And uh, it's just, can we be honest? And so even if we're talking about the milk of the gospel, how few individuals I have found in my existence 
can can tell the truth and can think about somebody other than other than themselves, right? Can 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 expand their circle more than just themselves and their immediate family to somebody outside of it. And this point here from Ammon to, to me is just that's what it is. You want to be like God? You want to be like the Father in heaven? You need to care about somebody other than yourself. It can't just be about you and your affluence and stuff that you get. It can't, You have to learn to care about somebody other than yourself. And how do you do that? By starting to understand, stop, stop treating Ammon like he's on a, an Australian from some other family on the other side of the planet, but, but that's all he is. Start treating people like they are your family and they're going to be a part of your eternal family. That, that we are going to be the sons of Christ. You know, we are going to become the sons of God like that. And th- what does that mean? He could have used any the, the, the soldiers of Christ, the colonels of Christ, the students of Christ. You come up with any word. Why sons? Because there is a lesson ingrained in that title that, that it is a family matter. President Nelson said salvation is an individual matter. Exaltation is a family matter. Family. A family matter. Sorry. You can be you salvation individual exaltation family. You have to think about somebody other than yourself. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, I wish people. I wish people knew this thing. Right. God is glory. God is glorious. And what is the glory of God? Is it the world's definition? Is it that He has all power, like all money and power? And the ability to play with us like we're pawns in a chess game. Like, is that is that the glory of God? Joseph Smith just says here, God is thus glorified and exalted in the salvation and exaltation of all of his children. The only thing that makes God glorious to him is that he brings his children, the entire human family, as many as will come up with him that's the only thing that gives him his glory it's not the ability it's us coming unto him that gives him glory so if we want to be like him and if we we, and which you can only do if you have the same desires as him right if you're you're doing it because you want to be some kind of you know all-powerful being it's the wrong sorry you've missed the mark it's only glory for you because you're trying to bring other people along for the ride. You're trying to yep. bring other people up to where you want to be. So if you're trying to do this game alone, unfortunately, you lose the game. And if you're trying to do this for the sole purpose of helping other people and bringing other people up, that's that, that will make you glorious in their eyes. A beautiful so, upon the mountain will be those feet, man. Yeah. I tell you what, I daydream, and and this is really um, nice motivation for me, but I daydream from time to time about what it will be like one day when I meet my ancestors. And I pray that this gives me enough motivation to be diligent in doing the work for them so that when I meet them, I am not ashamed. Mm. And so that when I meet them, my feet will be beautiful upon the mountains to my ancestors. I've been one of my recently too. One of my favorite lines in Lord of the Rings. You just nailed it. <laughs> that that was that is a hundred percent it. What what was his? What was uh, the king of Rohan? What was his big thing? He 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 felt like his whole life that he was going to die and be ashamed in the halls of his fathers. And his he wanted to be able to 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 go in whose mighty company he can no longer he will no longer feel ashamed. That's it. That is a hundred percent the spirit of Elijah. That's a great uh, great great motivator. I'm late, yep. but I'm clean, as Joseph F. Smith said. Yep. Yep. That's a good Amen. that's a good line, but I thought um the best one was what's dangerous. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's up there. That's up there. What's taking us? Yeah, that's that's a that's <laughs> number two or three. <laughs> <laughs> I was so I was so ready for something inspirational. That was, I was, <laughs> that was <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were I thought you were ready I, to drop the bomb on us. I thought he was too. And then yeah. you did yeah. <laughs> with the uh the the the, the side the the, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, good one. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Touche. Yep. Well played. Well no, played. You snapped us out of it. <laughs> All right. Shall I proceed? Yep. Okay. My insight number dose. So, funnily enough, this is another beautiful lesson learned through the Joseph Smith translation of. John chapter 1. Um, so let's get into this. So John chapter 1, verse 18. And now this verse, you're not going to know as I read this, the people who are listening to this, but it is very different to the original version. There's a lot more in this that Joseph Smith um, fixed than is in the original verse. Um, the original verse is, no man, no man hath seen God at any time. Uh the only begotten son. Yeah, I think I think uh, I can't, can't, but yeah, it's, I think it's yeah. Anyway, I won't even. But I can't. I can't. I can't really quite tell exactly what's. Uh, it's just what's the, the gold part. There. Is it, the gold part. Yeah, original? but that's not that's not right though because it doesn't go. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, or is it? Okay, well, it's, it is. Maybe it is. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Maybe that is the original. Okay. Yeah. It just, and so that's that, again, that doesn't really make sense, right? Like, I mean, it's disjointed. Yeah. It's, it's disjointed. It doesn't really make sense. And also, we know it's not true. So, um, you know, and you could argue away around it, but it's it's not really true. So here's, here's the, here's the original. I know. Oh, that's what I'm wondering. It didn't seem. Yeah, Quick, anyway. find the JST. Something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, so here's 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 the JST. Here's the JST version. So for, it starts completely different. For the law was after a carnal commandment to the administration of death, but the gospel was after the power of an endless life through Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, who was in the bosom of the Father. Already, how eloquent and beautiful is that? Like it's just so different. And it continues on. And no man hath seen God at any time, except he hath borne record of the Son. For except it is through him, no man can be saved. The only, I guess it takes out that, that yeah, it actually crosses out like the other bit's not in there. Um, so no man hath seen God at any time, except he hath borne record of the Son. For except it is through him, no man can be saved. So it actually adds a stipulation on there that we don't get in the um, normal Bible version. So the church manuals for this for this uh, passage says, in the Joseph Smith translation, the prophet Joseph Smith added this inspired qualification to the King James Version wording of John 1.18. No man hath seen God at any time except he hath borne record of the Son, for except it is through him no man can be saved. This important addition emphasizes that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. It also clarifies that the Father speaks to men on earth in order to bear record of his Son, Jesus Christ. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained, All revelation since the fall has come through Jesus Christ, who is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. In all of the scriptures where God is mentioned and where he has appeared, it was Jehovah who talked it was Jehovah who talked with Abraham, with Noah, Enoch, Moses, and all the prophets. The Father has never dealt with man directly and personally since the fall, and he has never appeared to accept to introduce and bear record of the Son. Uh, and then it says the scriptures record a number of occasions when the Father has introduced Jesus Christ. Now, that's, I, and I went and I was like, that's, and I already knew what they were, but I was like, I'm going to go look them up, and here they are, right? Well, here, so, firstly, I love that Heavenly Father literally delegates all things to Christ and only gets involved when he wants to testify and bear record of his son. He literally is that good of a delegator. 
there's some terrible delegators in this life. There's some terrible employ employers who will delegate you something and micromanage it till a completion, right? I've had that many times. Um, Heavenly Father is a really good delegator and he delegates to his son who is a really good delegatee. I don't know. What the <laughs> yes, but he's a really good doer, right? And he and he can trust him and have faith in him. Um, Finisher. Now, a what? Finisher. Finisher. There we go. Um, so the, the interesting thing, there are only two instances of the father bearing record of the son in the Bible. The first one is in Matthew 3 when Jesus was baptized. In verse 17, it says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I love that he just puts his stamp of approval on really important things. It's really quite nice. And then in Matthew 17, 5, interesting, they're both in Matthew. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus is transfigured and Moses and Elias visit Peter, James, and John, it says in verse 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Notice he's always well pleased as well. He's always well pleased with him. So there's one instance in the Book of Mormon and another two instances experienced by Joseph Smith. In 3 Nephi 11, when the Savior appeared to the Nephites, he was introduced by the Father. And you should all remember the story, but they all heard a voice and they weren't sure what, what it was. But the Father introduced, literally introduced his son as he appeared to them. So uh, I, I love that. I don't know. It's just so cool that Heavenly Father, he doesn't ever talk to us, but he will if it involves testifying of his son. And he, I just love the fact that he introduced him to the Nephites as he, as he appeared. Um, and then in Doctrine and Covenants 76, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received a vision in which they saw the Savior on the right hand of God and heard the Father's voice bearing record of his only begotten Son. Uh, and lastly, and this is this is the real kicker of one, and you will know what I'm talking about here. When Joseph received the first vision, the Father came. He came with Jesus Christ to restore the church and the truth to the earth. So it's interesting, um, as President Joseph Fielding Smith said, um, the Father has never dealt with man directly and personally since the fall, right? But he has, right? So he has because he, in those instances, he has. And in this instance, and what he's saying is not wrong. He, what he's saying is in general, he never he never does. But he has because he appeared with, with Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith. He came. All the other instances, you, no one saw him. He spoke. You know, he testified of, of his son. But in this instance, he came with him and appeared to Joseph Smith. And isn't that amazing? Like, think about how rare and precious it is to have the father appear to testify of the son in that instance. One time. Um, and think about how miraculous and marvelous the first vision, therefore, is and how blessed we are that it happened and that we know Joseph um, and know that it happened. The father didn't call down from heaven as he did in other instances. He came himself in his glory came himself in his glory to testify of his son in person to in person to the prophet of the last dispensation. And that's my point. I just thought that was amazing and awesome. And, and again, it's nothing new, but just to really reiterate how important and amazing the first vision was. Like, I mean, surpasses any other time of any other. When, when, when Heavenly Father, very few times has Heavenly Father ever spoken. And this one instance in the restoration in the last days, he came, and it's pretty cool. In a, in an instant, a thousand years of misunderstanding, and chopping and changing, and destroying exactly. the character of God the Father and Jesus Christ was instantly clarified. Yeah, just by just by Joseph looking up. Yep. Yep. Love it so much. You know, I just had a when you were going through this this Topher, I just had this insight that just that just came to me while you're reading it. it was so so good and that was the, the the father and christ showing us how to be good fathers and in a way that probably maybe this will upset some people jesus when he, he is being introduced by the father how does the father has the father introduce him this is my son in whom i am well pleased and yep. whom I am well pleased. Now, why? Why was he well pleased in him? Because his son had done right. Because his son was perfect. Now, what, what is the first thing that happens 
when Isaiah sees the Lord or the Father, or Joseph sees the Lord or the Father, if when any one of us see the Lord and the Father, what's the very first thing they say to us? In, in, in almost every recorded case, is it, hello, he- hello, Micah, I am well pleased in you. What's the first thing? Sins your sins, your sins are forgiven you. Mm. Now, why? Because we're not perfect. He could come to us and say, you're good the way you are. I am well pleased in you. I can, Good job, Micah. But he doesn't say that. If he shows up, you know what he's going to say to me? Your sins are forgiven you. That is a good father. That you you don't build up your children when they're being being crap. You don't say, good job, well done, well done for, for, for being terrible. Good job, good job. You don't do that. But you know what you do do? You say you're forgiven. You're loved and you're forgiven. Let's do better. Let's do better. Go and sin no more. We can do this. And when they do succeed, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my daughter in who I'm well pleased. I think, man, I just had an insight of how little we actually know about the, the father's parenting and the Christ parenting and how much is contained in just those two things. That when he appears to the children and all of us, even the most <laughs> righteous among us, if we served every moment of our day, as King Benjamin said, we would still be unprofitable servants. So we're not doing good. Even the ones among us that think we're doing good, we're not doing too good. The very first thing that he offers is forgiveness. Love and compassion and forgiveness for those that are repentant. And and what he does, what he does, every time he introduces his good son who, who who's done right and lived a perfect life, it's to build him up. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's a, that's a fantastic little lesson that, that, that uh, I think that I, I can uh, learn. I can learn something from as far as parenting. Mm-hmm. Awesome, really, really good. Nice, yeah, great point. Simple. Sorry, kind of random. Yeah. No, yes. good. I love. I love the but, addition. Nice, but spe- but so special. But who else in the Christian world is talking about this? Who else in the Christian world yeah. values this? <laughs> yeah. You know, do we value yeah. it really? Yeah, that's uh, this is you know kind of off topic, sort of. But me and um, my wife, we we often say like, and I don't not to disparage other religions and faiths and stuff, but it's like if I didn't believe in the Latter Day Saint, you know, LDS Church, I I, I could not ever be anything else. Like it, it would be like taking this deep, awesome pool of knowledge and wonderful things, and then trying to go and walk in a kiddie pool that is not fun and has no substance like there's nothing else on earth that could possibly come close to what is available in this in this um this church it's it's, it's so deep and wonderful and on uh, every like, like i says yeah on everything and who's talking about this stuff like who's talking about this sort of stuff like you know and and uh, and we you know yeah just just the insights we have on things that no one else could possibly know yeah Got to share them. Yep, and that's why we share them. There you go. All yep, right, and I will. I will go into uh, three brothers minus two brothers. Point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So John chapter one, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following him. And saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. Elder Holland said, quote, You will recall that when Andrew and another disciple, probably John, first heard Christ speak, they were so moved and attracted to Jesus that they followed him as he left the crowd. Sensing that he was being pursued, Christ turned and asked the two men, What seek ye? Other translations render that simply, What do you want? They answered, Where dwellest thou? Or, Where do you live? 
Christ said simply, come and see. Just a short time later, he formally called Peter and other new apostles with the same spirit of invitation. To them, he said, come, follow me. It seems that the essence of our mortal journey and the the answers to the most significant questions in life are distilled down to these two very brief elements in the opening scenes of the Savior's earthly ministry. One element is the question put to every one of us on this earth. What seek ye? What do you want? The second is his response to our answer, whatever that answer is. Whoever we are and whatever we reply, his response is always the same. Come. He lo- he says lovingly, come, follow me. Wherever you are going, first come and see what I do. See where, See where and how I spend my time. Learn of me. Walk with me. Talk with me. Believe. Listen to me. Pray. In turn, you will find answers to your own prayers. God will bring Rest to your souls. Come, follow me. End quote from Elder Holland. Christ boiled down all the commandments into two. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I.e., don't be a respecter of persons. Think about somebody other than yourself. If you were to boil down the Lord's teachings, his main message, his main theme, etc., into a single sentence, what might that be? I put forth Matthew chapter 6. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And what is the message today in this dispensation? Dr. Evans 105, there has been a day of calling, but the time has come for a day of choosing, and let those be chosen that are worthy And it shall be manifest unto my servant by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. And and inasmuch as they follow the counsel which they receive, they shall have power after many days to accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. Doctrine and Covenants 121. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world. Because they seek those things. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Quote from the scriptures. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We've done too much teaching our members what to fight against. What to not seek. And not enough teaching our members what to fight for. What to seek. The essence of our mortal journey and the answers to the most significant questions in life are distilled down to that single question. What seek ye? And our response to it. For me, it is the kingdom of God. It is Zion or bust. Awesome. Really cool. Um. Yeah, I, I, I love this. I, I mean, what's cool is it's really the answer to those two. Well, one's a question and one's a uh, invitation. You know, what seek ye? And then come, follow me. You know, and it, it's the answer to what seek ye. And it's the response to the invitation, come, follow me, as to uh, um, whether we are, you know, called and chosen, right? Or many are called and few are chosen, whether we're chosen, you know. The answer to those questions and that invitation really is what will make us chosen, you know. Um, I love it. Simple. Beautiful. Uh, Elder Holland, man, as well, just really knows how to lay it out there. But, yes, you know, Zion or bust, Zion or bust. Well, um. Something that really hit me there and that I think about a lot and I realize is really a problem in our church, and I love the way you put this, is that we've done too much teaching our members what to fight against, what to not seek, and not enough teaching our members what to fight for, what to seek. And I think that was a very significant reason as to why for so many years of my membership in the church, 
I was so uninspired. And so, and because I was uninspired, I only did the motions without any of the feeling, without any of the desire, without any of the zeal, without any of the, and without those things, you, you, you're not wanting to help other people. It, you become a very selfish person. And that's what I became. And it really crushed me. And I felt very strange because I knew the church was true. And I knew that I have a father in heaven that loves me. And Jesus Christ is my savior. And all those things I knew without a doubt. But I felt so empty inside. I just felt so empty inside. Because I all I was trying to do from day to day is just try not to do bad. You know, go to church. Try, you know, try to read your scriptures. Try to do whatever. But but really, just try not to break a commandment. Don't break yeah. any eggshells, Ammon. And in the end, maybe you'll be good enough for exaltation. Just don't yeah. break any eggshells along the way. And it was no wonder that I was totally depressed in that process. And that I yeah. looked around me at church and I saw people who were striving as hard as they could to not break commandments. And they were seemingly so unhappy as well. And I couldn't put my finger on it. I just could not put my finger on it. Why does everyone seem so unhappy about their discipleship if, all, if, if I know that all this is correct and all this is true? Why is everyone struggling so hard through it? And the whole reason I believe, a big part of that reason is because we're tr focused so heavily on what not to do that we lose track of the glorious vision of what's coming and what we what we're going to be part of and what we can become and looking forward to the future fighting for something fighting for something for our future fighting for something for someone else for our children for the savior to have a throne on the earth and reign as king of kings like like i mentioned earlier that i might not be ashamed when i stand in front of my ancestors at, at some day that I might look forward to doing my family history work and getting to the temple and rescuing some of these people, that in the end, my work might mean something. Not, not just don't sin, but do these things and become something so that I can release these people from their spiritual prisons. They can get a ticket of leave to be resurrected. They can come back to the earth and work with their family who they yearn over and love as angels on the earth to bring a bring about the separation and the gathering in unto the new Jerusalem and that they may f build a city, a holy city and a holy temple where the Lord Jesus Christ can rule and reign as King of Kings. The these things we look forward to now are life-changing things. They give me hope. They give me reason and desire. And I have, because of that fire in me, I want to be like those apostles mentioned earlier that ran to their brethren and shared the good news. I want to run and scream and shout and give a little bit of this fire in me to other people. I was about to say that because you make a good point. It's um, it's interesting, right? Like you're so you're so right that it's it, it's so easy for us as as other day saints to and we do we focus on so much of what not to do like that is it's like by default a huge part of the you know don't do all of this stuff we, we just have this huge list of things we don't do but it's so and that's what everyone gets bogged down and focused on so that so much so that when we try to tell them hey there's all of this stuff we need to do it's kind of like mm -hmm. a, a surprise almost yep. do you know what I mean like they're yep. surprised they don't know they don't don't know it don't understand it never heard of it you know it's part of our religion never heard of this thing Never heard of the New Jerusalem. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, because we've been so focused on, hey, don't do all this other stuff. Um, again, and then Ammon's last point there, tying this back is that's why we need to run and share this with everyone, right? Open our mouths, share this, because people don't know, don't understand. And then people are always like, why do you guys always talk about Zion? Why do we focus on the same things? Well, why are we talking about the New Jerusalem every week? Why are we talking about Zion every week? Why are we talking about the same things all the time? Um, wh why is this so important? Because no one knows. <laughs> no one knows. No one understands. We've, we've spent our lives um, bogged down on um, trying to stay within the lines, not break eggshells, as Emin says, that we've, um, we've missed the things that are coming in our near future that we need to be desperately trying to achieve and to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yes, and, hey, we will open our mouths. Great, great point there. Why do we know 
people haven't caught a vision of this? Why do we know that? How can we look at someone and go, I know you don't, you haven't got it yet. So I need to try and do whatever I can to help you understand it. Why do we know that? Because they don't have this zeal. No. Yeah. Because they don't have, if you're not out there trying to share this with someone, you don't have it. You don't get no, it. No. You, you either yep. get it and we know you get it because you're sharing it or you yep. don't quite get it yet. Right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What do you, and- you don't go out sharing restrictions like we, we don't, we, we can't do all these things. We're trying to like stay in the lines and, and these are all yep. the things we can't do. People aren't out there with zeal trying to tell people about that. You know what I mean? Like we don't do this, that, and the other thing. Everyone, just so you know, and I'm really um, zealous about this. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't, we're not, we're not zealous about that. But what we are zealous about is the events leading up to the second coming, right? Yeah, that's a good point. That, that is, yeah, and what that is such a good point that it's not so. So Ammon was at a UFC. Now Ammon, so we every football, UFC, anything. If if Ammon was like, oh man, I want or you know Taekwondo or whatever he's doing, it, I want to get you whatever it have. I don't know what it is. Uh, Jiu Jitsu. Jiu Jitsu. I I really I really enjoy this. Well, I'd be willing to bet you in every single one of those spheres, there's rules on what not to do. You yeah. you don't. This is illegal. You don't do this. You, you know, in football, there's all these things. Uh, in, in UFC, there's all these things. Is that how you describe it? Do you go? What is UFC? No. Well, UFC. No, it, it, I, what it's not. No. Is, I, um... <laughs> exactly that's exactly right that's exactly right well you know well that's what we do all day we just teach we just teach you what all the penalties all the penalties all day long you know well we we don't want to be off sides and we don't want to be this and that and it's like anybody who's been in the sport football ufc anybody will tell you that you can learn the rules in like five minutes of what not to do it'll take you a lifetime of figuring out what to do and how to master it. That that's and that's where you fall in love with the sport, not in the things you don't do, but in what you do do. And, and we're and so we're just a bunch of football players standing around and the game starts and we're like, wait, what what are we doing? I I I don't even know what what game is this. I just know that we're not allowed to be off sides and all I know is the rules on what not to do. I don't know what we're doing here. Like also, that's where does the ball are. go? Also, yeah, in that, yes, that's right. Right. take this analogy and add a layer. <laughs> oh, yes, good. In this scenario, the if you're on the team, you are going to win. And then that, so the real test that we have being on the team and playing the game and trying to master it is getting as many people as we possibly can to join us hmm. to fill the arena to 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 cut if you're willing get on the field with us stand in the watchtower with us Pro- mm-hmm. be, become israel become team israel on the f- field and look out for others and bring others in yeah the yeah. win is guaranteed but being but technically you know being on the sidelines or being the opposing team that's that's where you don't want to be but yeah, you know, yeah. And I would much rather teach that way all the time, but people don't want to do it. For example, for example, priestcraft. What do people constantly want to tell you? Is this priestcraft? Do, 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 well, what about this? What about this? Well, how about I tell you this instead? Preach without selling the word, without, without esteeming your... All the things to do. If I teach you all those things and said what the Holy Scriptures tell us to do, not good enough. Not good enough. What we instead have to focus on is the actual, the do not do's, the the, the rules of, well, yeah. well, okay, but if I'm off sides, but just by like a little bit, it's like, what are you doing? What are, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, I just told you that our, you know, that we need to move the ball this direction. Right, preach without selling the word. Esteem your brother as yourself. You're no better than the hearer. You're all one, right? That's what you do. Well, okay, but instead, it's like people just want to. We're so 
and we're having to fight out of this too. We're so ingrained to just focus on the what not to do and being like, well, did this person break the rule? Is it, did that person break the rule? Is that person off sides? That it's just like, why stop talking about this? You know, stop talking about this. You can't, figure out what you to can't do. Play a, you can't play a game, let alone win a game. If you're only focused on what you can't do, you're not going right. to be inspired to want to play the game anymore. If all Correct. you're doing is having a rules meeting. Yes. You know, yes. it's Correct. the worst part of yeah. any sport is having to get together and discuss the rules. Everyone hates it. Yes. We yeah. wanna, you want That's actually, the worst part if, about learning a new board game, by the way, is trying to understand the rules first. Every time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> board game's worst another part. perfect example. Another, another perfect example. Uh, perfect example. Man, would that be a terrible board game, man? Oh, my. <laughs> Now just, it's not that the it's not that it's funny because people are going to listen back to this and pick out what what they hear. It's not that we're saying that rules aren't important because without the rules meeting before the game, the game's just going to be a farce. It, correct. It's, there's going to be absolutely no point in playing the game. But it's not the major component. You do it. You get it out of the way. It's clear. Correct. Get it out of the way, and then you actually go forward and you play the game. And it's, it's not it, it's therefore no longer about what not to do. It's all about what to do in the lines. And have fun doing it. I, have fun. It's the exciting part. And in this game, everyone who plays and stay, sticks to the rules, and if you go outside the boundaries, repentance is there. The Savior atoned for our sins. We're not perfect. We all need that atonement to get back in the game. We're all going to win. But we have All to win. play. And if we're not doing and trying to be inspired through that process, if we're only focused on the rules all day, you will become like me in years past, uninspired, depressed in the gospel. Yes. And even though you know it's true, can't quite put your finger on why it's not really coming together for you spiritually. It's because yes. you don't have anything to play for. You don't have any reason to inspire you to get up off the field when you've been knocked down 10 times and chase that ball again. Yeah. Not to keep um, hammering this to death, but... Um, Let's do it. Let's do it. Hammer it. Another interesting thing to note is that the rules are what make games fun. You, you need the rules in place so that the game can be fun because if there's no rules, the game's a free-for-all and anyone yeah. does whatever they want and it's actually yep. not fun at all. So it's interesting that we need the rules. You know, we need we need those, those do's and don'ts so that the game has structure so that it's actually fun because... Otherwise, you're not, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you need to compete against, uh, you know, whatever or, you know, um, needs to be a challenge and um, and it will be fun that way. But so it's a, anyway, it's just an interesting thing. The, the rules need to be there, but that's not the fun part. No. It's not the part and when someone on. comes along and they go, okay, house rule, um, I win. <laughs> you know, when someone comes along and tries to yeah, change yeah, yeah. the rule in the middle of the game, man, that gets people angry and it should because it ruins the game. And so well, that's if like we've playing been... Uno with different people, you know, you play Uno and you've got your rules and then you play Uno with someone else and they've got their own like family rules. And in yeah. their family, you can chuck like, you know, draw twos and draw fours and what, you know, what, or do whatever you want. And in my rules, no, we do draw twos or, you know, like you've got your own rules and that I can't do it, man. I can't play Uno unless the rules are stipulated very clearly from the start. So the rules have to be set from the start. And from the very start, we've been taught things like follow the prophet. Real simple, but follow the Correct. prophet. And then somewhere through this game, we're winning the game. Everything's fine. It's hard, but we're inspired and we're winning the game. And the prophet comes out, who might be the coach, and says, guys, I need you to run in this sort of direction when you collect the ball. And then someone pipes up mid-game and says, hang on a second, house rules. I'm going the opposite direction. And then the rest of the team should jump down their throat and say, no, you're on our team. You knew the rules before you started playing. We stick to the rules in order to win this game. We're following so the coach. Not... And the That's coach right. has Listen said. To yeah. The coach. yeah, you're not going to win the team game by running in the opposite direction and throwing the rules out mid-game like someone playing house rules. It's funny. This is a metaphor that you could just go on for forever. Isn't it? Just... I got another one. I got another one. Oh, I can keep going. Here's another one. One more. Okay. Imagine a mat. You tell you don't do something you're not passionate about. What's the thing that that men are some of the most passionate about? Who they marry. 
Imagine a man sitting down and be like, why did you marry this woman? Well, because she wasn't Susan and she wasn't Jacqueline. And oh, she wasn't, you know. I'm sorry. The, the, that's the reasons why all the re- all the rules. That's why it wasn't because you loved this individual that you were passionate about. This individual. That's what moved you forward. No one had to. No one had to put a poker in your back. You know, hopefully, and we're like, you're gonna marry this person. You know, at least in the West, you you. You pursued this course because you wanted to do this at one point in time. Why? Why? Right? It was was sure it wasn't because you were focused on the rules. It wasn't because, you know, you were like, well, she's not X, Y, and Z. So, you know, she's good to go. No, it's because she had (laughs) things that were desirable to you and you wanted them in your life, you know, for life and eternity. That's that's why you sought after them. And, and that kind of passion is what you need to have in the gospel. You need to you need to have that thing to fight for. Yep. yep. Well said. Great analogy. Let's just Box. add another. No, I'm not just kidding. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. No, that was good. I'm, that's, I'm all that's, that's, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. Unless you've got it. a skateboarding <laughs> one that you want to throw in there, Chris, or um, uh, 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 so stick, there's stick, this stick, hill, stick, right? Stick. There's this hill, and it no. <laughs> No, good. All right, Ammon. I think it's Ammon's turn. Yep. We were due for one of those. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a little while. Good. Yeah, okay. All right. Analogy works. Ammon's insight number three, brothers. We've got three free brothers. Everything's free. Okay. It's from the scriptures. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they who were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and this is talking about John the Baptist, by the way. John the Baptist was the one crying in the wilderness. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, who was to restore all things, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is of whom I bear record. He is that prophet, even Elias, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose, or whose place I am not able to fill, for he shall baptize not only with water, but with fire and the Holy Ghost. The student manual, it says, the identity of John the Baptist. In John, John the Apostle recorded information about the identity and ministry of John the Baptist. Brother Bruce R. McConkie explained that when John the Baptist began his ministry, The whole Jewish nation was stirred up with anxious expectation, awaiting the momentary appearance of the Messiah and his Elias. With great hosts from Jerusalem and all Judea flocking to John and accepting him as a prophet, and with the banks of the Jordan crowded with his baptized converts, it was natural for the leading Jews, members of the great Sanhedrin, whose obligation it was to test prophetic claims to send priests and Levites to make detailed investigation. The Jewish leaders asked John if he was Elias, that is the Greek name for the Hebrew, Elijah, who was prophesied to someday return. In the Joseph Smith translation, the Lord revealed a more complete account of John's response to the Jewish leaders, which conveys John's knowledge of his own mission as one who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. To their queries, John confessed and denied not that he was Elias, but confess, saying, I am not the Christ. So John was an Elias, but he was not the Messiah. John understood, as the priests and Levites apparently did not, that there are various meanings for the name title Elias. John was an Elias, which means a forerunner for the Messiah, but he was not the Elias, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. John was also not Elijah the prophet, whose name in Greek is Elias. Uh, He says, I am not that Elias who was to restore all things. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. John's testimony left no doubt that he knew of his own divinely appointed preparatory mission and of the divinity of the preferred one who would come after him. 
I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is of whom I bear record. He it is, he is that, that prophet, even Elias, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I'm not worthy to unloose, or whose place I'm not able to fill. For he shall baptize not only with water, but with fire and with the Holy Ghost. When John denied that he was Elijah, the Jewish leaders asked him, Art thou that prophet? Their question likely had reference to the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. However, by asking John if he was that prophet, after John had already denied that he was the Christ, these Jews showed that they did not understand the messianic nature, nature of Moses' prophecy. Many of the Jews in Jesus' day anticipated the coming of a prophet who would be like unto Moses, but who was not the Messiah. This is evident when many in Jerusalem later proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the prophet, while others declared that he was the Christ. So there are two points that I want to make on this. Here is the first one. It has been over 2,000 years since Moses' prophecy regarding the coming of the Messiah, and yet the Jews in the meridian of time still did not understand it. They had 2,000 years of time pouring over this prophecy, pouring over the pr prophecy to understand it, and they still had no idea. They were waiting for a prophet named Elias, or Elijah in Hebrew, that was not the Messiah and completely missed the mark. They missed the mark so hard that they killed the very man whom they waited on. That's how hard they missed this. A prophecy 2,000 years in the making, plus from that time prior, they missed it so hard that they killed the very guy who they said they were waiting for. That's how hard they missed it. They didn't just not know him. They killed him. I, I, I can't overemphasize how badly the Jews missed this mark. Um, and, and I don't be, trust me, we're as bad as them. I'm going to get there. It's not that I, I have a problem with the Jews and not us. I've got a problem with anyone that misses the mark, including me. So let's carry on here. They, um, it's only been 200 years since the restoration of the gospel. And in that time, an element of our church has done the exact same thing as the Jews have done. They have completely misunderstood the prophecy of the second coming of the Savior and replaced it with a fictional Elias that they call the Davidic servant or an Indian warrior prince or princess and therefore completely dethroning, once again, dethroning the Savior's position just like the Jews did. This group of people are going to cut themselves off from the Messiah all over again. And we've quoted this before, but Brigham Young said, the Gentiles will be as much mistaken in regard to Christ's second advent as the Jews were in relation to the first. Now, they got it wrong over 2,000 years, and they killed the guy. And we have a big percentage of our church, a seemingly growing percentage of this the true church of jesus christ on the earth who is doing the exact same thing so my recommendation to all of you who are doing that is cut it off um otherwise when he comes you're at risk of doing the same thing that the jews did to him the first time okay that was the first point second point is this who is the right this is from the student manual um, for isaiah chapter four it says who is the righteous man from the east John saw a vision similar to Isaiah's and spoke of this righteous man as an angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. The Lord revealed to Joseph Smith that this angel of the east was Elias, which was to come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. Of this angel, Elder Bruce I. McConkie said, who has restored all things? Was it one man? Certainly not. Many angelic ministrants have been sent from the courts of glory to confer keys and power to commit their dispensations and glories again to men on earth. At least the following have come. Moroni, John the Baptist, Peter, James, John, Moses, Elias, Elijah, Elijah Gabriel, Raphael, Michael. And since it is apparent that no one messenger has carried the whole burden of the restoration, 
but rather that each has come with a specific endowment from on high, it becomes clear that Elias is a composite personage. The expression must be understood to be a man, a name, and a title for those whose mission it was to commit keys and powers to men in this final dispensation. Thus, the man from the East seems to be to mean angels of the restoration who are grouped together under the composite title of Elias. My words, the angel, this angel is Elias, a composite of all angelic messages involved in the restoration. Elias is therefore the title of one that prepares the way for the Lord by committing keys and power in this last dispensation. From the student manual of Malachi 3, who is the messenger sent to prepare the way of the Lord? And who is the messenger of the covenant? Joseph Smith was also an Elias in that he was a forerunner, one who prepared the way, who laid the foundation for the second coming through the restoration of the gospel, just like our mate John the Baptist for the Savior Jesus Christ at his first coming was an Elias. Bruce R. McConkie said the time of the restoration makes this time period this is the time period and responsibility of Joseph Smith. Close quote. So if this angel is the statue that we previously placed on our temples and its composite title is more correctly Elias as the composite personage responsible for bringing the keys and the power to make ready for the coming of the Lord, then Joseph Smith Stand, stands at the head of this dispensation holding the ultimate responsibility over that work and is the greatest embodiment of that angel, that Elias. Ergo, this is an ergo for Michael, because Michael, because we haven't had one today. Ergo, Joseph Smith Jr. is the symbol of the angel we previously hoisted onto our temples. Nice. I was I was muted there. You threw out an E R E G O versus an E R G O, and then you threw out a J N R versus a J R. Like you you took it and you Aussied that up. <laughs> that was awesome. That's awesome. You know, it's <laughs> it's important to to re to remember here as well with this that the that. It didn't always used to be that statue on the temples. People need to realize that 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 at one point in time, the Nauvoo Temple actually had a weather vane with Joseph Smith on it. So, like, like at one, at one point in time, like, it, I think it was a, it was a very interesting picture. Go look it up. The, the Nauvoo Temple with the the weather vane with the angel which was Joseph Smith and he's like in temple clothes and everything. So it's kind of interesting because it was like, you have like, we, we keep things sacred in the temple, but it was like at one point in time, it was like our, our, our angel on the weather bay with Joseph Smith in temple clothes. So it's kind of like, I, but, uh, but anyway, so it, it's important to know that this is something that was that way from the very beginning. Uh, it, Joseph Smith taught this very, very, very clearly from the very beginning. So, mm -hmm. It's just a heartbreaking thing, man. I, especially going through the, the 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 Old Testament last year, and it's going to be the New Testament this year, and it's just going to be like, it's just every week. It's it, there is something in it every week. It's like, just take the time to do the come fall me. What you have to do. See, this was so crazy. Like these Jews, you're going to have to just throw this stuff out the window, man. You're just going to have to just be like, I don't study the come fall me manual. I don't study the the student manuals. I don't do that. I don't need to. And I'm going to throw it out. And, and that's just so sad because it's like, okay, but admit, admit that you're not, you're not sound in the doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ, Saturday saints, you're going rogue. Just admit that. Um, the other thing I would say here on this point, and then I will stop was the um, point here where he, he's, he's saying, okay, I am an Elias, but then he's asked about Jesus, the Christ. And he says, he says, I'm not the Christ. And then he says this, I am not that Elias, I'm not that guy who is going to restore all things. Yep. Which is fascinating because this gets back to that topic that seems to be really popular now. It's like some certain topics become really popular with the saints for months or years. And But the, the Messiah bin Joseph 
versus uh, Jesus, the two two messiahs. And they're asking about both of them. They're asking him if basically if he's Joseph Smith or if he's Jesus. He's at that because that those are the two big anointed ones. But are, are you the one who's going to restore all things? Or are you this anointed Christ? He's he's asking both, and uh, J- John answers, "No, I'm I'm neither of those things." But uh, so anyway, it's really interesting because you all have which you talked about last week. We have Jesus Christ, who was obviously a, a sinless sacrifice for sin. You have jo- John the Baptist, who was the greatest prophet born to man, and Joseph Smith, who beside Jesus Christ, no one had done more. So it's fascinating that you have you have. These these individuals asking John the Baptist about uh, uh, Joseph and, and Jesus, and without the without the littlest bit of envy, without the littlest bit of jealousy, without the littlest bit of any of those things, he said, "Nope, not me. These guys, th- these guys are, are are who I'm uh, who I'm following, man. These guys, I'm not I'm not even gonna be worthy to latch at his shoes. I mean, such humility, man. Yeah, uh, just baptizing with water here, like I'm." I'm just doing what I can do. I'm just baptizing with water. But but the guy that you're talking about, when he comes, he's baptizing with the you know with water and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and fire. Yeah, yeah there's a good there's actually a good lesson to learn there from John the Baptist, who uh, he he worked his he worked his butt off, right? His yes. whole his whole life, like hard. And um he was rich. I don't want to go back. I don't, huh? And he was made himself rich off the proceeds of doing that. Yeah, oh, naturally, he was rolling naturally. in gold. He had a palace um, in the wilderness like you wouldn't believe, <laughs> filled with locusts. It, and there uh, was an oasis, um, bookcase um, from here to here. I think it was called uh, Aquaba. Um, yes, that's true. Like yeah, that. yeah. A- enough, there is an no, anyway. so. So what I'm get what I'm getting at though is to take it back to the original game analogy from from the last insight. He he was playing the game right. He he worked his butt off in that game and he played the game with very almost like in a rule set, really specific rule set. Like he was um, to baptize, you know, and he, not even nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. Like he had this really specific cut down. Um, role that he was you know he was an elias he was a forerunner and he was to baptize and like that's it like he was you know he had a really specific job um and there's a really interesting like lesson to learn there is i mean we we now have a lot more freedom than like like his role is really specific we have a lot more that we can do a lot more authority a lot more um responsibility a lot more and um there's a few lessons to learn here one is a lot of people want more, you know what I mean? Like want more and, yep. and why. Uh, a second thing is we can't manage the responsibility we have. Um, yep. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of lessons you can learn from this, but like he nailed his mission. Do you know what I mean? Like he, and he had, he had, he had, he had restrictions. He had, he had restrictions on what he was to do, but he smashed it out of the ballpark. Um, second thing I wanted to say, the Jew is missing the mark. Um Ammon made a point that the Jews had 2,000 years to learn and understand about the Savior so that when he came, they should have understood who he was, right? They asked they asked questions. They asked John the Baptist those questions, uh, whether they're sincere in their trying to, you know, whether there was sincerity in them trying to learn or whether it was more uh, the Sanhedrin trying to trick or to twist, you know what I mean? Who knows? But um, they, had a, they had plenty of time to understand and to prepare and they didn't. Um, and so when he came, they missed the mark, right? The interesting point to add on to that is that they still are waiting. They had 2,000 years before he came. They, it's been another 2,000 years. And they still have no Messiah. So think about that. So uh, and that that actually is mind-blowing. Uh, like, uh, yeah, if, if you think, I don't know. With the no Lord, second guessing. And no yeah, second I mean, guessing. How do they not see the issue with that for a start? Anyway, but like, why would the Lord make them wait four thousand years for a Messiah? It's it's crazy. Um, anyway, uh, I just thought it was interesting that it's been another two thousand years and they still have, you know, they're still missing the mark. Um, mind you, many many Jews are now, you know, 
real you know they're becoming christianic Jew, jews what do they call them messianic jews so because you know being jewish is obviously a, you know it's a race as well as a religion technically so um you can become a messianic jew and that's becoming uh, more and more common which is great we, and we know that you know as the time of the gentiles ends and the the time of the jews uh you know gets into full swing that's going to happen more and more and more so it's really cool um so anyway that's the point i wanted to make is they miss the mark they're still missing the mark um and again we we've just going to be careful that we don't miss that mark ourselves right like you know there's a million ways that we could do that um leading up to the second coming and again this is why we talk about the things we do over and over and over again because we don't want to miss that mark and we want to make sure no one misses it so yeah cool perfect i feel like there's something else i had too but i can't flip it around right now anyway good stuff now um do i go on anything else should proceed yeah you're good all right my insight number three brothers um okay now uh so as i said before micah actually uh covered the same um, passages from the manual but i did, 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 did let me just read my point here quickly um I got a bunch of stuff here, so I'm not going to read all of that again. So I'm, I'm going to start with the scriptures, though. Verse 41, verse 41, and verse 45. Um, it says, "He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ." I think this is talking about Andrew again. And then in verse 45, after, and this is after they brought, you know, he brought Simon Peter to to meet the Savior. And then uh, in verse 45, he says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, just interestingly, considering going off the previous insight, they didn't miss the mark. You know, they they listened. They found him. They 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 got in there. Like, so it was possible. It was possible. Um, it's, yeah, just unfortunate that so many did. Um, anyway, so the church manual for um, that is what... Um, Micah read earlier, and it was um, from David B. Haight talking about just imagine being in the Savior's presence, having this experience with him, and listening to him, his, his inflection in his voice, and describing who he was, and shaking his hand, and having this wonderful encounter, which you can only just imagine how amazing that would be. And then the first thing you want to do, who can I, I need people to, you don't selfishly go, oh, I'm so cool. You know, like it's like people meet a celebrity, you know, like some people you'd meet a celebrity and you go, I met Shakira. Or you know what I mean? Like, and it's like, you know, you don't, you know, you don't get get other people to come and meet them. You like hold that selfishly. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like I'm better. I how cool am I? I, I met such and such. I met, you know, Jim Carrey. You know, I don't know who, but it's like you know, people don't go run out and try and get people to do that to to, to come meet them. They they keep that as like a thing that they've done. But when you have this experience with the savior, they instantly want to run and share this with their family, their loved ones, their friends, whoever it may be. Um, and that's what um, Elder David B. Haight and President Dallin H. Oaks were talking about. So um, these were my words based off, off that. Sharing a testimony of the Saviour after meeting him physically is one thing, right? Meeting him physically. But gaining a testimony of him as the Saviour and testifying of this to others without having seen him is another thing. So they saw him, but doing the same thing without having seen him is, a it, you know, it's a bit of a different Thing, bit of a different story so faith is kind of removed when we when we see him in the flesh right you've seen him um which is why seeing the savior now is such a rare experience like you know it obviously be very very rare um but gaining faith in the savior but <laughs> this was my late my late point um, but gaining faith in the Savior enough to share it with others is special and important, of course. Why does it matter? Because the world is filled to the brim with the opposite. And again, this ties in kind of nicely to everything we've been talking about. The opposite of faith, the opposite of charity, the opposite of virtue. We are bathing in a world filled with the opposite of the person we are striving to emulate, sons of God, right, and to meet. If we want to emulate him and become a son of God, and become like him, we need to share our testimony of him. 
we need to even those odds. Actually, we need to beat those odds. Our light needs to surpass and dwarf the light of Babylon. And so lastly, how do we gain this testimony of him? Um, John 145, chapter 1, verse 45, the church manual says for that passage, when Philip told Nathaniel about Jesus, he said that he had, he had found the person of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Philip and other disciples were able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah because they had been searching the scriptures for signs of the Messiah. That's the difference there. Nice. Uh, the law was the first five books of Moses, while the prophets were books such as Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Zechariah. Later in his ministry, Jesus commanded his listeners to search the scriptures, which were the books of the Old Testament in his day, because they testified of him. So my words again. So the apostles were ready to accept the Savior when he came because they had studied sufficiently <laughs> to know him, to know him. They knew the signs and prophecies. They knew his character. Do you know the signs? Do you know his character? Right? Do you? John uh, 1 verses 9 to 11, coming 9 to 11, one of those verses, says he came unto his own and his own received him not. So we are his own. We are his own. Like the Jews were his own and they received him not. We are his own. What are we expecting? What type of saviour are we waiting for? The Jews were expecting a certain type of saviour. They're still waiting for that type of saviour, a saviour a savior to save them from bondage, from their enemies, from all the tribulations that they've had. What type of saviour are we waiting for? Will we recognise and receive him? Jesus had John the Bapt Baptist testifying of him in mortality. Do we have anyone testifying and bearing witness of him in our mortality? Yes, we do. Joseph Smith was and is an Elias, a forerunner, and through the church, restored through Joseph, we have the keys to seership in our living prophets. And that's that. That is a 2 a.m. win. <laughs> that's a win, a, a rambling win once again. <laughs> uh. Yes, yeah. I, I love that point about the scriptures. I love that point. I love I love that point that uh, it, it, that they because they read the scriptures and understood the prophecies, they then could then experience the the conversion and and the understanding that this is the savior. Once again, confirming once again that we do not have the right to the guidance of the Holy Ghost. We don't have the right for guidance of of additional insights and additional revelation if we're neglecting what is already at our fingertips. And so these were these were stalwart um people who who were who were looking into this. But uh, another key insight here, were they the educated? Were they the rich? Were they the affluent? That's no. the same thing. Interesting. Interesting that this is the same group of people that seem to be interested in what John was teaching. Which was a which we learned the, the previous week a practical religion. If you have two coats, sell it, give it to somebody else. These were people that were living a practical religion. They didn't believe in priestcraft. They they weren't the educated class of Jews. You could say they weren't the the upper echelon affluent Latter Day Saints. These were the fishers and the workers and the farmers who who didn't believe in that level of life or that it was appropriate. They lived it. They lived after the manner of happiness, you could say, and and, and they understood the scriptures. And uh, and are those connected? Absolutely. And we've learned about that in the Book of Mormon, that that the, the preachers did not receive substance uh, for, for preaching the word of God. Yea, they did rely upon God so that they would qualify for the grace of God and they could treat, teach with power. That's what it actually says in, in, in the Book of Mormon. So that is a prerequisite. So. You know, you living in that affluence, practicing that level of priestcrafts with the scribes and so forth. What seek ye? I don't. I don't. I, I don't seek Babylon. I, I'm, I'm a fisherman, right? I, I, I'm not that person. I'm sitting here by the waters of this river with John the Baptist. Man, this is not. That's not what I see. Come, well, then I can talk to you. Th then you're ready. But these other people that are still just so set on that, no. Nah, I'll tell you it. it, it 
it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. So, yeah. Well, you said that a lot more eloquently than I could, but I shared the exact same sentiment. I also love to hear this question. <clears throat> Two questions. What are we expecting? And what mm-hmm. type of savior are we waiting for? Because the Jews were waiting for a savior that came down with a drawn sword that yep. destroyed the Romans on their behalf, that um, made bare the, the, his arm in the sight of all the people and did yep. such miraculous things to rescue them from their supposed bondage that he could not be denied. And the opposite savior came. He came yep. as the lamb. He came as the humble man born in the caravansary in the manger where people, the people around him wouldn't even open their doors to see what was going on, yet they could watch the very birth of the Son of God. And the only people that came with an interest to him were the wise, the truly wise, and the truly humble, and one other group, I forget. But nevertheless, it's it wasn't the rich and the learned and the knowledge and, you know, those that suppose that they were full of the knowledge of the Jews. So what type of, my point is I'm bringing this back to our time now. What type of savior are we waiting for? If you're waiting for a savior that is not the one prophesied to come the second time around, you'll miss him. You're looking for something else. And when he comes, you won't recognize him. It's the, it's the exact same thing. If you're not, one of those in those three groups that Elder Pre- uh, President Oaks talked about in his Christmas devotional. If you're not one of those groups, and you you haven't really come to understand who he is, you haven't really understood who he is. You haven't really been diligent in searching the scriptures to understand how he is going to return and when he is going re- to return, because we see the signs of his coming. If you're not doing those things then whatever you are expecting, whatever, whoever you are waiting for, if you're not doing those things, you're going to miss it or you're going to, he's going to come and you're going to be disappointed the same way the Jews were disappointed. Well, this one is coming as a lion. So if you're you're expecting a a lamb this time, you're now again looking for the wrong, the wrong savior. In the wrong feasts. In the wrong feasts. Yeah. It's even it's even deeper than that this time around because this the process of the Savior's second coming is is a drawn out multi visitational process to certain groups that have prepared themselves, and so we even have members of the church today that say to themselves, "It's probably not in my lifetime, so I'm not going to do anything." But if it does happen in my lifetime, then I'm just going to be caught up to meet him. And we're all going to be good. I'm going to skip over any trials and tribulations. And I'm just going to be called up to meet him. The problems that you have with that mentality are those that haven't prepared themselves for the first of his four visitations, because that's the fourth. Those that haven't prepared themselves for the first of those four visitations miss out on the fourth. So you actually, you have to know what the first visitation is. Yeah. In order to be one of the five wise virgins that gets into the bridegroom's feast, wedding feast, which yep. is Zion, the New Jerusalem, which is the first visitation of the Savior to the earth. And if you haven't prepared yourself for that, then unfortunately, you're not, you're probably not going to make it to the fourth visitation. So that again, if we don't understand the scriptures, we don't understand the macro last day timeline the Savior has given us constantly. Uh, and that's what this, this group is for aren't we for that are we aren't we that little i mean i'm probably the least humble of the group but i'm trying my best to be with the right people in the right places talking about the right things so that when the savior comes in his second advent it's no surprise to me i'm a child of light i'm not going to be he's not going to catch me like a thief in the night i'm going to recognize him at his coming yeah amen amen Couple more, couple more, more uh, things were the the kingdom. So you, the the he, they wanted somebody to come in as a lion who would set up his kingdom and then consume the other nations. But once again, we don't think that's going to happen when Christ comes. We think it's poof's just going to happen. We skip the whole kingdom party. Comes, 
sets up the kingdom, inherits the kingdom, and then wipes out other things. The other thing that we're going to get into in the New Testament in the, in the next couple of chapters is the feasts. So there's all these wonderful celebrations and feasts. And what did he come as? He came over the Passover lamb. And what we're going to get into is that he showed up at all these events and he would stand up and be like, I am the light. What you're doing here is me. I'm the light. And then they're like, kill him. And then, and then, they, <laughs> and then, and then he would stand up at the next event and be like, I'm the living water. That's me. And then they were like, kill him. It was like every single event. It was like, that's me. But what, you know, what was the one that we're missing that they were actually looking for? The Feast of Trumpets. They were looking for the redemption. That literally the season of their redemption versus the season of the, the lamb, the season of the sacrificial lamb. And once again, what are we skipping over today? Oh, the redemption of Zion has no, it's literally in the name, the season of redemption. It's literally in the name. And once again, we're like, nah, it's no, nah, I'm not looking for that Jesus. It's like, how, how, do, how do we get these backwards? But yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's the season of redemption. Redemption of Zion. It's in the name. Skip that, like Micah. The... Micah, skip that. We need to talk <laughs> about Adam on Diamon that doesn't involve us whatsoever. Let's talk mm. about Adam on Diamon that has nothing to do with us. It's true. And it's true. if if we get any notice of it or we get any kind of attendance to it, I'd be surprised. But let's put mm. all of our latter day, last day timeline discussions focus squarely on that which has nothing to do with us. And completely skip over the tenth article of faith. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so sad. I I hope more people wake up to that because it's a very really, really cool event, something to fight for. The redemption of Zion. Join the Lord's youth battalion. Do it. It's not because they don't know here's the thing as well. It's not because they don't they've not heard it or they don't know it. It's because they don't have the faith that it's real. Yeah. It's true. It takes faith to believe that something as crazy as the clearing of a location and an actual holy city being built before it's all said and done. And people, yeah. I, I honestly believe people don't have the faith to believe in such a thing. So they focus their attention at something they can believe in. Oh, Jesus is going to come to earth in some private priesthood meetings and meet with key people. That is not me. So I don't have to do anything. I'm not. I don't have to do anything, but he's going to meet with key people to do certain things. And it might be a mystery that I can believe in. Now that's something I can write a paper about. That's something I can make a video about and talk to the saints about. And I'm sure the saints can get around that. No one, no one denies that. Right. Saints. You, no one's got a problem with that. It doesn't require any faith whatsoever. We're all cool with that. Yep. Everyone nods their head. Yep. We've all done a good job. We're all so faith filled. Oh, but guys, what about the redemption of Zion that has to happen first? The holy city, the thing that the Savior has been trying to do since the time of Adam. The, the what? Yeah, the 10th article of faith. Um, I'm agnostic to that idea. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, so sad. Uh, I'm agnostic. Um, it could, yeah. Let's stop talking about that. Back to things that don't involve any faith whatsoever, right? Yeah. Love it. Not us. Classic. It's true. Not us. I, I not, don't. not us. Don't need the faith. No problem. Move on. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be around people like that. I, I want to be around people that believe in the Savior that haven't shortened his arm that still believe in these things. That's what I want to be around. And that's what this group is. So I'm, I again join join with the saints. You don't have to feel like you're that little. You're waving your little flag from wherever you are and you feel so alone because you still believe that the Lord is going to fulfill his word literally because he doesn't change. There are those mm -hmm. of us out here that are just like you. And if you feel that way, join arms with us because we are only stronger if we do that. We're only, we're only closer to the ability to build Zion if we do that. So don't hear the message and go back to your hole. Get out of your hole. Come and join us. Get out of your hole. Get out of your caves. Yep. Amen. Get on some towers. Mm. On some towers. All right. All right finish this up.
All right, I'll, I will finish. Phone, my phone battery dies. Let's do this. Okay. 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 Two of three. Okay. John ch chapter one, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel. Everyone knew I was going to cover this. Nathaniel coming to him and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Student manual without guile. While discussing the Savior's statement that Nathaniel was a person in whom there is no guile, Elder Joseph B. Worthlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to be without guile. To be without guile is to be free of deceit, cunning, hypocrisy, and dishonesty in thought and or action. To, the, to beguile is to deceive or lead astray as Lucifer beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden. A person without guile is a person of innocence, honest intent, and pure motives whose life reflects the simple practice of conforming his daily actions to principles of integrity. That one is so important. That's judging fruit stuff there. To be without guile is to be pure in heart, an essential virtue of those who would be counted among true followers of Christ. And that's an important one based off of what we already gone over. President uh, Nelson committing us to be those people ready. If we are without guile, we are honest, true, and righteous. All of these are attributes of deity and are required of the saints. Those who are honest are fair and truthful in their speech, straightforward in their dealings, free of deceit, and above stealing, misrepresentation. Man, is that a big one. Or any other fraudulent action. Any other fraudulent action. Including with your fellow man, especially with your fellow man. I believe the necessity for the members of the church to be without guile may be more urgent now than at other times because many in the world apparently do not understand the importance of this virtue. End quote from the student manual and from Elder Worthlin. My words for honesty is greatest. It continues to blow my mind. That should be an S. It continues to blow my mind how people apparently do not understand the importance of this virtue. It continues to blow my mind. People will take more offense, infinitely so, at being called a moron or mean, etc., than at being called out for being dishonest or being called out for being a liar. No one cares. No one even blinks at that. You call someone a moron and everyone will clutch pearls. You call someone out for being dishonest or caught in actual deceitful actions or lies? Meh, no one cares. Bringing this up with other saints, this conversation right now, what I'm saying right now, it will spark a conversation about what it means to be nice. It will not spark a conversation about the damning effects of being a dishonest man to the core, which is truly amazing. Honesty is more important than most realize. People would rather be considered wise and intelligent, etc., and kind, etc., while also being a known liar or as a dishonest individual versus simply being an honest individual. They'd rather, if so long as people view me as wise, so long as people view me as intelligent, so long as they view me as kind and tolerant, etc., those are all so much more important virtues. I'd rather have all those and be known as a liar and a cheat and a dishonest individual. I'd rather have that than versus simply being an honest individual. Despite the fact, once again, it is singularly the only trait listed in those th surrounding the throne in Revelation. For they were without guile, honest. I'll take being wrongfully accused of being mean or abrasive etc 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 all day long what they will never take from me is that i am an honest man something that cannot be said of the dishonest period beautiful love it um yeah look like 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 you and um again i don't say this to what do we say toot my own horn um, but I do consider myself an honest person and to a fault. I think I've mentioned this before, but like, I can't help, I can't handle when things aren't, um, anytime that like, I can't, I can't lie. I can't, I can't defraud. I can't do any of that stuff. It's not in me. 
Um, and, and, and I've always been that way. My patriarchal blessing actually says that I'll be known as honest and upright. Um, and so I, and I, I kind of, you know, I pride myself on that fact. And, um, and it ties that in, in my patriarchal blessing to my work. And it says that I'll be known as honest and upright and willing to work. And um, that trait, I know for a fact, has served me in my career many, many times. Because, you know, if someone, take it in any instance, but in, at work, if someone knows they can trust you, uh, imagine someone you can trust versus someone you know you can't trust. Who 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 excels, you know what I mean? Like, the, I mean, maybe the person who you, you can't trust might stab you in the back or something and try and ruin you. But aside from that, your boss is going to trust someone who is honest and upright every time. And it has served me well my whole life. Um, and we live in a world where, as Micah just said, it is insane and common how many people are willing to dig a pit for their neighbor, um, you know, to get gain at the expense of their neighbor. Um, this is the world we live in now. People will do that all the time now, you know, and what gain is it to get gain at the expense of someone else? You know what I mean? Like unreal. And I've seen it. <laughs> there are times actually, there's been um, some big news headlines in just in Perth where I'm from where members of our church have defrauded other saints and um, public people in, in um, some business stuff. Unreal. Wow. I can't like, I can't remember the exact circumstances. There's been some property ones. There's been some other ones. Um, yeah. Jeep is going back to even our, our, our father lost like my, our dad lost his life savings to um, through a member of the church basically. But wow. anyway, it's, yeah, it's crazy the the amount of people in this day and age who will uh, dig a pit for their neighbour and try to get gain at the expense of someone else. Um, it's unreal, and I, I I don't understand. I can't I can't believe that. But the other the other kicker about an honest person is that they are. It goes hand in hand with humility, and an honest person is humble, and they'll repent. You know what I mean? Like an honest person can confess their sins. If we're honest with ourselves and with God, we can honestly confess our sins and repent properly as well. There's that as well. You know what I mean? Like this, it's such an interesting subject. You know, it's such a, and so important. Um, and a particular in this day and age to be able to stand out with that characteristic when the rest of the world is going the absolute opposite direction. And, and as you said, Micah, they don't even feel bad about it. You know, like there's not like... you. <laughs> Like out of all the things to like label yourself with, there's all these things and, and being dishonest, being a liar, being a cheat, being a thief. They're not like even, you know, a lot of people wouldn't even like bat an eyelid at that being a, uh, a label that they have, yeah, which is crazy. So um, I, anyway, I can testify that being an honest person um, and not having God. And again, I don't, I'm not, I'm not better than anyone. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that at all. Uh, I'm just saying I've strived to be that way. I, and I know in myself that I am that way. And it has blessed my life for sure. And we should all continue to strive to be that way uh, rather than being the dig a pit for my neighbor way um, because it will bless our lives. I just think it will bless our lives in general, but also Heavenly Father will bless us as well if we strive to do that. Amen. I've got a story for you. <clears throat> About three years ago, I bought a, an item of sports memorabilia from a collector. and. I used to collect sports memorabilia a lot and I bought something and it was really expensive. It was pretty special. It was a, a fight used pair of gloves from a, a Japanese mixed martial arts fighter who I really thought was awesome. Anyway, um, the word got through the grapevine that um, I had those gloves and somebody spoke to that fighter and it turns out that the fighter was defrauded of those gloves from a man who said he was going to put them in a museum. And when he found out that the, the museum wasn't going ahead and the guy just started selling the stuff, he got really, really upset because they were from a, a it meant a lot to him personally. And so I found out on the grapevine that he was upset. I found out that he wanted to get the gloves back and I contacted him and said hey um i know i've heard that you want these back 
I know you're upset about it. I know it's not fair that you were basically defrauded out of these gloves. Let me get them back to you. And uh, he was really grateful for that. And all of a sudden, the whole memorabilia collecting community came down on me. And they said, what are you doing? It's not your fault. You didn't, you didn't know that he wanted them back. You spent good money on these. It, it's not your problem that he's upset and he wants them back now. He, he doesn't own them. You own them. You don't have to send them back. You don't have to give them back. And I said, I know, I know I don't have to. That's fine. But man, I would feel much better about myself. And I'd feel like I'm really helping this guy out if I can get these back to him. So anyway, long story short, we did a bit of a deal, I'm, we, which was pretty fair. I got him his gloves back and he was really excited about that. And that was fine for me. Th three years went by. Two weeks ago, I was in Japan and, uh, and he's a Japanese guy. And I really wanted to go to a, a, a sporting event for New Year's Eve in Japan, but the tickets were sold out. And I remembered at the last minute, oh, this guy actually works for that company. Maybe I'll ask him if he can help me get a ticket. So I messaged him and he said, meet me in half an hour. So I met him in half an hour in Tokyo. And he goes, I'll get you a ticket. The, the game was the next day. He goes, I'll get you a ticket. See me at the stadium. I get to the stadium and he pulls me in, takes me backstage, gives, gets me the ticket and then, and then starts recording a video and says, this is the guy who helped me get back. My, he didn't have to help me. He didn't have to get the gloves back to me, but he helped me get back something that was precious to me at, at his expense. And so to give my appreciation, you know, you're here today to go to this event. I also want to make you um, a bracelet. So he has a company that he makes special bracelets. And then he also said, I think you might like this as well. And he presented to me his championship ring from when he was the heavyweight champion of the world. And, and it, look, the, the things are fine. Like that, that's cool. But the feeling that I got was, this is how you make people feel when you try, you just try to be an honest person. You try to help people, even if it puts you out a little bit, you try to do the right thing, even when it's a bit hard. And even when voices to the opposition are saying, don't do it, don't do it. You know, even when it's a little bit hard. And at the end of the day, the best thing that I got out of that is the friendship with that guy. And for the rest of my time in Japan, we were talking and he said, keep in touch. And, you know, like, I feel like I've just made a really good lifelong friend. And, um, and it was just a really cool example to me that you don't have to ever expect anything. But people really appreciate it. And it changes lives when we're honest and we try and do the right thing. And that was one of those moments where I had one of those little life changing moments where I could see the fruit bearing fruit from my attempt at being honest and being without guile and trying to do the right thing, even if it a bit of an expense. Awesome, man. Cool story. Honesty, number one. Hey, yeah, man. Honesty. honesty is greatest. All right. Is that it? We're going to wrap this up? Yeah. Wrap us up. Take us home. Take us home. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this today. Um, brothers and sisters, this is just so fun to do this. We feel so blessed to be alive today. In this day, the days in which we know the Lord is going to perform his most wonderful works. The days directly before the second coming of our Lord and Savior. Right, we are Zion or bus, or as President Taylor said, the kingdom of God or nothing. We know that the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, is the Lord's Church, and we're doing everything we can to prepare the world for the Savior's second coming. We, we, we are doing everything we can, and brothers, sisters, we're, we're not trying to take away from your your come follow me study. We hope to to that you will share with us your insights that you're going to read this, the readings this week. And do exactly what we talked about this week, that you're going to learn these things and then want to share them with other people. Share them with us. Share them with your friends. Share them with your loved ones. If you are interested in learning more and you want to link arms with us, check us out on Discord or on Facebook or on the YouTube channel. Links are always provided below. Share your insights with us, please. We, we, we want to learn with you. We want 
to uh, give you a, a soundboard. We want to we want to be that uh, be that uh, person with you. So please share with us your insights. Zion cannot be built without a group of righteous saints. It just cannot. It can't be built up. And the greatest manifestation stations, the greatest blessings are never because of individual enterprise. We need each other. We are we need the three. three. Brothers, and we love you. <laughs> we love you. Love you guys. See you soon. <laughs> bye bye.